let, well, so let me just give you a, a, um, a basic overview of, of what we're going to do here together. Um, so I'm assuming, uh, given just the size of the group, that you know we're all coming from just diverse backgrounds, experiences. We may be practicing in a range of, if you're in the Buddhist world, a range of Buddhist traditions. And uh, some of you may not even be associated in, in the Buddhist world, other traditions or however you practice or have been taught. And so with we're going to be um, talking about this term, and we'll, don't worry, we'll define everything, samadhi, uh, which is the term generally translated as concentration. Um, it's a terrible translation for samadhi. I'm going to explain about that may be actually that's a controversial statement. I'm going to be making a lot. I'm not trying to be controversial, but there'll be things and I'll point out some things that other people will have different views and you may have different views, too, which is fine. Actually, it might make it more quite interesting. Uh, so uh, um, but I'll explain what I, why I think. But we're stuck with it because everybody uses the term. But the problem is there are so many connotations in English of what we mean. So we want to get clear about this term concentration, how it relates to meditation practice. And in particular, um, in the tradition, I'll explain if you don't know of Theravada Buddhism, where if you hang around traditions like it's a Insight Meditation Society in Barrie, Massachusetts, Spirit Rock Meditation Center on the West Coast, this what we call the Insight Meditation Scene. <clears throat> and I'll ex explain all that. So, you know, there's a lot of confusion, I think, and controversy about it's not like it's not as bad as it used to be, but you know, back in the day, it was you know you had to do this thing called you wanted to get something called insight. We'll talk about what do we mean by insight, and if you're doing concentration, which we haven't defined yet, we will in a few moments. You're not doing insight, and so how do these two fit together, and what do we mean? Why can't you do one or the other? And and it it, it was not clear. So what I'm hoping we'll do here is um, two parts. I want to step back and go back to the old source texts. And you can see if you've looked at all, even glanced through these notes, we're going to spend some time going through to see what do they really say and try to just really tease it out. So uh, uh, and then we can come back into modern times and see how does that apply to the range of ways people t teach. And because it's not one way. And so we want to bring it very alive to actually our practice. And the idea for my idea is not that you have to remember all the details. That's up to you if you want, want to, uh, but that it will inform your practice so that you'll have the basic feel of it. And it'll help actually not be confusing as we go through a lot of detail, but actually be clarifying about in our meditation practice. So that's the basic idea. And the way we'll do this is we're going to start with, uh, I'll just give you the basic overview and it follows your notes again. You know, what is Samadhi? How is it understood? And what are a few different ways it can manifest? This is important. And then we'll actually go look and we're going to, uh, I'm going to explain what I mean by the Pali language in Theravada Buddhism in just a few moments, but we're going to go through these old Pali source texts and see how is Samadhi discussed and talked about in relationship. And especially if you're familiar with any of the Buddhist lists, like the Four Noble Truths, Seven Factors of Enlightenment, some of the, some of this called Four Foundations of Mindfulness and uh, other, other, very important meditation uh, texts uh, and lists. How is it viewed in there? And then we'll talk about, some of you know the word jhana, and some of you may have heard it but don't know what it is. We're going to spend a lot of time. Go so by the time we're done, you'll really have a lot about jhana and different ways it manifests. And then finally, and this is getting, we're getting more into next week, then we'll go into some of the, we'll bring it into more modern context, some of the controversies, disagreements, and try to look at different perspectives people have, and how does that relate back, and um, 
and hopefully we bring it very alive into our own practice. So that's, that's the overview. And you can see it, what I just said, follows the notes. Um, and I'll pause for questions in just a moment before we get going, but one last thing. Um, this is very, very important. There's not a right or wrong. This is actually good news. Um, and we'll spend a lot, I'll, we'll be saying this over and over again. You'll probably get sick of hear, hearing me say it. Um, but it's literally true. Um, I've been around a long time in this scene, more than 50 years. And from what I can see, people have attained just amazing, tremendous levels of pick your favorite word, liberation, enlightenment, realization, awakening. We, I don't want to get too much of these different terms. Um, that would be a whole discussion. Um, to me, those terms aren't all the same thing, but that, uh, that's, that's a different, we can talk about that actually, if you want. Um, practicing in every different way you've heard of. Uh, and so we don't have to make people right or wrong or think we've got the right way. It turns out there's actually not a right way. And this is good news. So rather than get confused, we want to inform what's our own doorway in? What's our pathway? It's not going to be the same for all of us because even if we gave the same meditation instruction and practice to all of us, whatever practice we gave would not work well for everyone. What works well for someone just isn't the best practice for someone else. And how the meditation unfolds, how samadhi and jhana unfold, it's not the same for everyone. So uh, this is good news. We want to take what, we, what we're exploring here and then um, see what are the different flavors we're talking about? How do they relate for your own practice? That's what's important. So, okay, well, let's start in then. To begin, I actually, one piece I didn't mention, I just need to take, this is probably less than five minutes. I just need to give a little history to set the context for all of this. Uh, some of you will know this, but it might be new for some of you. So according to tradition, after the Buddha died, we'll just, we don't know his exact dates, actually. That's a whole other thing. It's controversial, not controversial. It's just, we don't really know the exact dates, but we'll sometimes we'll say 2,500 years ago. I think it may not be that accurate anymore if they've revised the dates. After the Buddha died, um, the tradition tells us that um, within a couple of months, a council, a great council was held. And it said 500 of the monks, you know, there were these tremendous, wonderful, enlightened women, but I guess they left the women out in the meeting. It seems to be the way it can go sometimes. Um, and came together, they said 500. Whenever in the old text you hear the word 500, it just means a lot. You know? And came together to recount and review the teachings so they could come to an agreement about what they were. None of this stuff was written down at the time of the Buddha. No one was taking notes. And so um, the tradition tells us that um, uh, Ananda had been, Ananda was the Buddha's younger cousin and had been the Buddha's attendant for the last 25 years of the Buddha's life. Ananda had been around for all the Dharma talks, so he recounted all these teachings and uh, they all came to some agreement about, uh, yes, this is really the authentic teaching. And so when you go back into the Pali texts, many of them begin with the phrase, thus have I heard. Well, that's Ananda speaking to you. Uh, actually, I find that uh, kind of thrilling when I would read them because I feel like he's really talking to me, uh, recounting. So, and what happened was the, the teachings as they were re re recounted and, and agreed upon, evolved into what today are um, a body of work, these texts called the, in Pali, it's the suttas. Sometimes you'll hear in Sanskrit sutras, Pali, it's suttas, and it actually means thread. It's related to the English word suture, like, you know, if you're doing surgery, a suture, like thread. So, um, um, and it got preserved in this body of work called the um, 
we call the Pali in the, in the language. Pali is also preserved in Sanskrit, suttas. Um, and that's the, the, the compilation of the texts we have today. There are some other texts in, in there, what, uh, but we don't, we're going to, we're fo mainly focused on these suttas. And then what happened is over, uh, over the centuries, it was still preserved as an oral tradition. These things weren't written down for, let's just say, three, four, five hundred years, something like that. We don't know exactly, but several number of centuries. Now it was recount. They chanted it together in groups, and it was probably actually uh, more reliably preserved because uh, writing is prone to error, and they would chant according to tradition. You know, chant in groups. They could self-correct each other. That's how it was preserved. So it kept changing and evolving until it was finally written down and, and got fixed in the form we have today. That's the polytexts. Uh, one other thing, um, back in the, really starting immediately after the Buddha died, people split off into different groups. You could call them sects. People had different understandings since sincerely held, you know, understandings of what the teachings actually were. And you end up with a number of different Buddhist schools and the traditional number is 18. Um, all of those early schools died out except for one, which is still alive today as a, as the, as a living tradition. And that's called Theravada. The Theras are the elders. And that's the style of Buddhism today that's alive in Thailand, Burma, Sri Lanka, maybe Cambodia and Laos in those countries. The evolution of the Mahayana, which is like Chan and uh, Zen and a lot of those, uh, those were later developments. They kind of went off in different directions. And so we are not going to talk about that. So we're dealing with this living tradition out of Theravada Buddhism. Um, and the, the, their text preserved in Pali. So one more thing to add in. Along with the, the suttas, the, the source uh, uh, texts, there was a whole body of commentarial literature that developed. And it culminated in a work. This is a long tongue twister poly name, although by the time we're done here, this is going to be rolling off your tongue as naturally. You're going to be an expert, but I'll say it's with a V, Visuddhimagga. And the Visuddhimagga means path of purification. And this is important because the, and it's the last bit of the history and then we'll move into the material. The Vasudhimaga is not a commentary. It's a treatise written by Buddha Gosa. We don't know exactly when, but we'll say at least 500 or more years, 600, I don't know, uh, after the Buddha. And it brought together the commentarial understanding of what was meant in the suttas. And so the reason I bring this up is now today in Theravada Buddhism, this is a, a gross generalization, but you can divide everything into two kind of camps, if you will. There are people who say, if you want to understand what's in the Pali suttas, you've got to look at it through the lens of what the Vasudhimaga says about it. And there are other people who will say, no, 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 the Vasudhimaga got it wrong. You just go straight to the suttas as if, as if there was no Vasudhimaga. And this is one of the things we're going to explore because they're both very, very important views or different schools of thought within Theravada Buddhism. And it really, as you're going to see, heavily influences how we view all these topics, the view of what jhana is, what samadhi is. What is insight meditation? How does it work with concentration? It actually turns out these are two different models. They're, this is what I'm saying here is actually controversial too. I think you'll have to make your own decision, but they really are different. So this is where we are now. And um, I think that's enough of a background. Um, we're actually going to be looking at Samadhi and Jhana in the suttas as if there were no Vasudhimaga. And then we're going to look at Samadhi and Jhana and the Vasudhimaga as if there were no suttas, see what they say on their own terms. And then this is over the two, two weekends. And then we're going to um, um, 
come back and look at some of the controversies and see the different sides. So that's kind of the map. All right. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's just move on then. Um, so I'm going to go in your handout here. Um, if you look on the first page where I just said goals for the class and um, if you don't have the, the, the notes, it's fine. Um, I'm sure Rob or you can contact me. I can get it to you. Uh, my, um, it was really kind of a little sales pit. Back when I did this, it was still back when people were, it's not like this anymore, fortunately, but people were kind of uh, denigrating the Samadhi side of the practice. And so I put a few quotes here from the Buddha to say, well, wait a minute here. Here's the Buddha. I'll just say this. I can, this is uh, out of some, one of the suttas. The Buddha said, I considered could jhana, which we have, which we'll get to be the path to enlightenment. Then came the realization that is the path to enlightenment. That's a pretty strong statement, right? So how it, and then one more, the Buddhist quoted here as saying there are five detrimental things that lead to the decay and disappearance of the true Dharma, Dhamma, Dhamma in Pali, Dharma in Sanskrit, and he goes through them. One of them is uh, you dwell without deference and reverence towards Samadhi. So how can they get away with, with saying Samadhi and John is not important? How, how do they do that? So that's a question. We'll get into that. That they have a way to do it. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go. If you want to follow along, I'm not going to just read right out of the um, suttas. I'm just going to talk here. But um, if you go to the second page, I have a, a, a title there: Samadhi and the Pali Suttas. So let's just start with this word Samadhi. That's both Pali and Sanskrit, and um, it's generally translated as concentration. Um, it actually, if you go to the etymology of the word, <clears throat> it means undistracted, right? So concentration is, um, we actually got that term because the early um, Pali translators more than a century ago from the Pali Tech Society, to whom we owe a great debt of gratitude, but they didn't, they, they didn't know so much back then. And so uh, they picked the word concentration, it's stuck and now everyone uses it. And then we all apply our own connotation to the word, but it, but it means undistracted. So if, if there's a controversy about uh, how much concentration you have, nobody has a controversy. There's no controversy about being undistracted. So we're gonna use the word concentration, but I wanna just offer that, suggest that <clears throat> every time you use it in your mind, you think of the word undistracted. Uh, you know, nobody, no teacher says be distracted, right? <laughs> so um, this is now I want to point something out. Of, and this is a real, uh, if you don't remember any, from time to time, I'm going to mention something that I think is a real key point. And this is one of the real key points, and it will help clarify a lot. There are a number of ways in which an undistracted mind can manifest. Um, let me name a couple of ways. Um, the first one, um, um, the first, I'll, I'll come to that chat question. It's a good question or comment in a moment. Um, one way that the mind can become undistracted, and I'll use an analogy here. Um, I know sometimes in the morning I'm, I'm re uh, um, reading the news or something I can get, or I'm reading a book and I can get absorbed into the book. And someone may come in and say, hey, Richard, Richard. And if I'm really absorbed into the book, um, I may not hear them for a moment. Then I might go, oh, sorry, what, what? That's an example of where you can get so, <clears throat> one of the words they use is one pointed, which is a kind of a funny word, but we get so, kind of narrowly focused on where our attention is, that we start to some degree losing awareness of other experiences around us, right? So you get the idea about that. And if you were to say you were to meditate and let's just say you were 
there's many ways to meditate. Say we're doing mindfulness of breathing and you were putting your attention on your breath. You could get so good at or skilled at staying concentrated just on the breath, you could get very narrowly focused. This is where they use the word one pointed. And it's not literally a point, but it can just be on the one thing. And your concentration can be so strong that you, you literally lose awareness of everything else. You can get to the point where you won't feel your body anymore. You won't notice it. Thoughts will be gone. Everything, there's just the, and as we'll see when somebody gets stronger, some of you will know this from your own experience. You can have all these experiences. Don't worry, we'll get into all this. Bliss, light, all this stuff can happen. If you really take it far enough, maybe there's only bliss and light, right? And um, if and this and so the way they talk about this is they call it one pointedness because you're on the one thing, and sometimes it's also called um, um, uh, uh, exclusive concentration because you're exclusively on one thing and your awareness excludes everything else. That's one way it can go if you took it far enough. There's another way it can go, this is very important, and to, to distinguish, I take this word, we'll get into the poly later, that they translate as one-pointedness. And I call it unification of mind. It's still got the uni, which is one. Um, and in this way, oh wait, so sorry, one more thing. If you got, if you got into exclusive one-pointedness, for you, the experience of changing phenomena will have stopped. They call it fixed concentration also. You just won't notice all the stuff going on. It'll just be in this, right, this one samadhi. If you get in the second way it can manifest, which is just as deep, but it's, it's, it's just um, uh, qualitatively different, rather than the flow of uh, experience stopping, the mind well, sorry, just a moment. I'm going to use the term mind. Um, and I'm not going for a laugh or anything. I just want to say, I don't know what the mind is. <laughs> we use the term and I'm sorry, I want to just acknowledge I'm using the word mind loosely, sloppily, but hopefully we can at least kind of convey some ideas here. Um, rather than the flow of experience stopping, the mind comes to steadiness and stops but you haven't shut off the flow of changing experience. This is an undistracted mind, but rather than being undistracted and it's wholly focused in a narrow way, it, it can be actually quite broad and spacious and open, but it's so clear and present and undistracted that everything is seen and known as it arises and passes away within this undistracted presence, if you will. It's a different kind of undistractedness. inclusive samadhi. Sorry, I, I think I hung there for a moment. And this kind of open, spacious, undistracted mind that doesn't exclude everything. It's inclusive. It includes everything. It actually opens uh, to the changing flow of experience. Yeah. It's a different sense there. If you haven't experienced these, it, it's hard to, but hopefully you just get the conceptual about that. Yeah. And there's a quote from uh, the great Thai master, Ajahn Cha. He's no longer alive, but um, um, he's, there's a quote, some of you know, this is very famous, called the still forest pool. And this is pretty close to the quote it ex exactly says, make your mind like a still forest pool. All kinds of rare and wonderful animals will come to drink at the pool. You will see many things come and go, but you will be still. And he goes on. That's the idea. Now, I'm not, neither of these, one's not better than the other. They're just different. And you can meditate. We'll get into this next week. You can meditate in a way to cultivate purposely one of the others of these styles, inclusive, narrow, or uh, a near, inclusive wide or exclusive narrow, or on your own, it will naturally head in one direction or another. Uh, and you can steer it in the other direction. But I don't know if I'll be able to get into that much here. I could talk to you offline about that if you needed to. Um, 
But you can see, and this gets into someone sent me a chat here, which uh, I thought was good. It says there are few traditions that fall into bare awareness practices, which say no samatha. Now he used the word samatha, which is different than samadhi. We'll talk about that later too. Samatha means tranquility. So a lot of people will equate samadhi and samatha, uh, but I, I think they're different. There are other traditions which say without samatha practice, you're wasting your time. What are your thoughts? Well, this comes back to what we're talking about here. I think for all practices, we want to have some degree of, even if it's a little bit, just steadying to be present. So we're not just, our mind's just not scattered all over the place. We're not just lost and spaced out all the time. We can have some ability to be present, even if it's for a few moments, that's a little bit of settling. So some degree of presence, I think we all think is important to cultivate. And then other people say, will say, uh, you don't need to go much deeper, just enough to just get here and then just notice changing phenomena. That's the kind of practices they'll talk about, insight practices. Others will say, no, 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 you have to really go deeper, deeper in the samadhi to get even more undistracted. So let that sit for now. That's, that's just, uh, we're actually going to go in a lot of detail to get that exact question answered uh, more later. So I want to pause here for a moment, just, just on this one thing and see if anybody has a comment or a question. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, with that distinction before we move on is um, uh, if we really can get clear about that, and I don't hear people talking about that distinction that much. I can't be the, I'm sure I'm not the only one, but um, so many uh, confusions and controversies um, just clear up because we see it's not one way again. There's different ways an undistracted mind can manifest. Okay. You might look into your own practice and see to whatever level you've, uh, uh, um, whatever level your samadhi, your undistractedness has developed. Which way is it going for you? It's not a right or wrong, but we want to pay attention to how is it unfolding for each of us? Okay. Um, all right. And I'll come back to some of those. Uh, you keep sending the chat things. I see them, but I'll come back to those. Okay. Well, we're going to continue then. I'm staying on your notes if you want to use the notes. And there's something in the middle on page two. It says, write samadhi. Well, in the Pali tradition, there's what's called the Four Noble Truths. I know many of you know this, but to make sure we all do, and it's um, really a foundational teaching. Uh, um, just real quick, uh, First Noble Truth, which is, um, um, is the truth of uh, suffering. It's actually another bad translation. It doesn't say life is suffering. It uses a term dukkha. It has a lot of different translations, but um, dukkha basically, if you go to the Pali, uh, back in the days when it was a print version, the Pali Tech Society, Pali English Dictionary was this big, thick book. It was 11 by 14 with really small 10 point font. And to define dukkha, it took three pages. I've got the book I could show you. So it's it basically the etymology of the word dukkha means it's the, the, the axle of a, the, of a wheel of a cart is out of, out of round. So dukkha means what's wrong, what happens if, if, if your wheel's out of balance, you get a bumpy ride. That's dukkha, bumpy ride. Uh, so the first thing is, is that um, there is this dukkha or, and it becomes suffering when we're clinging. If you're not clinging, you're okay having a bumpy ride. You're not suffering. But we can say suffering. This is fine. But we want to understand. Second one, what's the cause of it is craving, tanha. It doesn't mean desire, by the way. There's plenty of desire. It's where it gets so strong that you can't let go. I'm saying this, I know it's super quick. Uh, the third is that there's an ending of dukkha, which is called naroda. You can come to an end of it. And then the fourth uh, a noble truth is called the Eightfold Path, and it's this whole path of different elements. 
and we use the word right, and it's not right or wrong, but it means right. Um, it's actually the word that's like there's right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood. I know I'm saying this super quick. Um, right effort, right mindfulness, and the crown of it is right samadhi. So samadhi is a big deal in there. Um, the word right in Pali is sama, S-A-M-M-A, -M -M -A, and it actually means to be connected in one with. So it's not right or wrong. Right's okay. Wise is a good one, wise and skillful. It just means if I wanted to gain a certain result, what would be the right thing to do to do that? If you do something else, it wouldn't be the right thing for that because it'd give you a different result. That's sama. Right samadhi is explicitly defined as the four jhanas. It's all throughout the text. There's no ambiguity about it. We're going to come back and look at that in detail later, but it's the, we don't even know what John is yet. Some of you do, but so this is, um, um, this is a big deal. So uh, first of all, it's going to get back to, wait a minute, how do people who sort of uh, de-emphasize, I shouldn't say denigrate, although some people do, but de-emphasize samadhi, Again, how do they do that? Because it's um, um, it's really clear, right? Samadhi is jhana. I do want to say one thing that's very, very important also. When you hear that, you may think, oh, great, if I don't have jhana, I don't I got wrong samadhi. But, but I want to offer, and I, many teachers I've heard say this too, I call, it's true the suttas say uh, jhana is right samadhi. I say that Right samadhi culminates in jhana, but any degree of samadhi you have is right samadhi, as long as it's influenced by the other elements of the Eightfold Path. Right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood. Right? That's right samadhi. Whatever you have is what you have, and that's what we work with. But it may, it may interest us to think, well, maybe it would be... Um, good to um, know that some jhana could be something if you're interested you don't have to people seem to get their enlightenment in uh, styles of, of practice that don't include samadhi we're going to name all those styles later by the way what's the difference of the definition of right samadhi based on the sutta versus the vasudhi maga that's the basis of our whole time together so we're going to answer that question okay so um this is important because it, it informs a lot of el what else we'll do. Um, let me pause here for a moment because we're going to move on again. See if anybody's... I'm sorry, uh, just pl please be aware since there's so many of us, you know, the gallery view, there's about, about five different pages, so I want to look through. And... Okay. I would, by the way, just as an aside, this a uh, little off the topic, but uh, well, maybe it's on the topic. Um, I would say there's no right or wrong anything. This is just my own. There's only what's happening in the in in the present moment, and how do we work with it? What's happening, and how do we work with it most skillfully? You know, sometimes people will talk in terms of good and bad meditation, and we know what they mean. But uh, we all know that. But uh, there's actually, I would say there's no such thing as a good or a bad meditation. There's only what's happening. And then how do we meet it? And how is it worked with? And even if it feels like it's all falling apart when we hold it with right attitude and um, do the best we can to work with it, then that's, that's good, it's good stuff. All right. So um, I hope the pace is going okay. I feel like I'm trying to keep moving along, but um, I'm trying not to talk too fast, which I can do when I'm trying to get through a lot of material. Um, okay, thank you for, I see a couple of thumbs ups. I guess it's okay. And you can let me know if I need to speed up or slow down. I see, okay. I'm gonna keep going like this. All right. So now we're still, before we're getting into jhana and all of that, which we're going to spend most of our time on, I want to back up because the path of actual, when you go to the Pali Suttas, 
there are many teachings, but they're not actually the nuts and bolts meditation, or I'll say Dharma practice, which to me is more than just the meditation. Uh, and they tend to get, they're scattered throughout the suttas in many different ways, but there's a few really main, very um, foundational, important te uh, texts or lists uh, that I want to take a look at and, and um, see, well, how do they talk about samadhi in these lists? <clears throat> um, one of the reasons for lists, sometimes Buddhism is called the religion of lists, but it's part of the oral tradition on how things were were preserved and memorized, right? Um, so we're going to take a look at some of these. And um, I'm, I'm at the bottom of page two, and I'm actually going to go into page three on your notes. One of the most important lists is called the seven factors of enlightenment. It gets a lot of emphasis. In fact, I have a... Um, uh, I don't think I put this quote into your notes, uh, but I'm going to give you a quote. Right. Let me just give you a quote that's not in your notes. This occurs, I think, three or four times in the Pali Suttas, and I could um, I could give you the reference if 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 I, I could have to go look it up offline. The Buddha is quoted as saying, "This is a paraphrasing." Everyone who's attained the, the final goal of this practice, you can call it nirvana in Sanskrit, nibbana. You could say enlightenment, liberation. Anybody who's ever done it in the past, who is doing it now, who, or whoever will do it in the future, this is how they did it. They were to set aside the hindrances, which we're not really going to talk about too much here, but the hindrances are just... There's a list. It's just certain qualities that come up in our minds and bodies that can be hard, like if we're too sleepy or we're too restless or we're caught in aversion or there's a whole doubt. There's a whole list of hindrances. You've been able to bring, bring the, um, that, the hindrances down enough so that secondly, you can practice what's called the four foundations of mindfulness, which we're going to discuss in a moment. And then through doing that, you bring to perfection the seven factors of enlightenment. So if we're using the poly as a model or a system, that's, that is really the core of the whole thing. We've got to be able to bring this hindrances. You don't have to totally get rid of hindrances ever, but enough so you can practice. And we do these practices called the four foundation of mindfulness. Now I'm going to suggest in a moment that the seven factors of enlightenment is actually talking about jhana. And if that's true, you could think of the four foundations of mindfulness, which I'll explain also in a few moments, as uh, actually being a path to develop jhana. Well, that's kind of controversial because most people think it's what we call a dry insight path, which doesn't include jhana. So hang on, we're going to get to that. So um, I don't want to, let me just name the, what the factors are real quick. And I'm going to leave it to you to look through the notes on page three and up at the top of page four, but really what I'm doing there, I just don't have time to really pause there, but I pull, if you're interested, I'm just trying to show my own argument of for why, when you look at it and look at these different terms, it really seems like samadhi is getting a lot of emphasis. What are the seven factors of enlightenment? Um, they're in your list, so you don't have, but I'll just say the first one, uh, it's called sati, which is mindfulness. The second one is called Dhammavichaya, which is um, invest. Oops, did I think I may have hung up? Oh, uh, there. Uh, first one is first element is sati, mindfulness. Second, Dhammavichaya, which is um, investigation, like an inquiry. It's like, that's the kind of the insight part. Uh, the third one is called virya, which is energy. It's it's related to the English word viral. So you have an energetic approach. The fourth is this word PT, which I said rapture, but that's we're going to get into that term when we talk about jhana and more. The fifth is tranquility, which here is the word pasadhi, which just means tranquility. And the sixth is samadhi. And the seventh is, uh, so concentration, the seventh is upekka, which is equanimity. So notice it culminates in equanimity. Um, 
since uh, samadhi is is defined as the four noble truths as the right sam- as as jhanas, um, I think here you it doesn't say that, but um, uh, if you if actually sorry, let me back up. The way I approach the Pali Suttas, which may or may not be historically accurate, is to try and see them all as a as a cogent, uh, coherent whole. So different parts are all informing each other to make a, what would you say, a, a cohesive, coherent uh, message. Uh, that may not be historically accurate uh, by the way they evolve, but I think it just makes for just a better way to try to work through this rather than seeing all these subtle or not so subtle differences that we can't make sense of any of it. So I'm doing that right here because I'm using uh, what the Four Noble Truths have told us that um, concentration is um, uh, right right concentration, which is John. So I think maybe that's enough on that particular list for now. Unless someone, I'm going to pause on seven factors of enlightenment. See if anybody. Oh, Leon. Can you? Yeah, thank un- you. Yes. Hi. Hey, Leon. Please go. Sure. I was just wondering: uh, should these seven factors be developed one after the other? Are they sequential, or are they kind of all developed together? Ah. Uh, Yes, thank you. And actually, I, I'm sorry, I meant to say this. And, and so I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, so the, it's it's actually experienced. It's actually practice and experience in, in different ways. Sometimes it is meant as a sequential list. So you start with mindfulness and then you bring the uh, what you call the, um, uh, you know, start to put your attention on whatever phenomenon. That's the insight and the inquiry side. And through con- Continuing to do that, you arouse more energy. You get into the PT. You get into more the samadhi experiences of the PT, which we'll des- we haven't described. Um, you get more tranquility. You get into the samadhi. So it's 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 a sequential development, and you can approach it that way if you want. Sometimes it's just a bare list of qualities, and it's not. Oh, well, one other thing: the se- the seven factors of enlightenment can be prescriptive or descriptive. Prescripting is prescribing how to practice one by one. Descriptive is descriptive is it means it's just describing what's there uh, really in I would say in states of deep samadhi and jhana. So all the different ways that you can think of and approach it are, are people teach and practice and have I can just say experientially have tremendous benefit. Okay, Leon, yeah. Okay. I hope that answered that. So thank you, thank you for bringing that up. I meant to say that. Um, just one moment. I want to come back. Um, is inclusive understanding of the samadhi the same as open awareness? It is, but there are different kinds of open awareness. Um, some can have more samadhi than others. We'll get to that later. How do we meditate in the way to get to the still forest pool? Well, so that's, we're not going to be able to get into actually how to do that because we're not actually a how to practice in this session. But what I would say to you, um, um, hopefully you have, I mean, you can read, my, I have a book. I, I'm not, pushing book, but there's lots of good books out there. My, my second book is called The Art and Skill of Buddhist Meditation. You can go look at that. It's actually as, talks about specifically about that. You're welcome to contact me or if you have other teachers offline and we can talk more practice oriented. One more, even before the seven factors of enlightenment are developed, shouldn't we first focus on developing our sila, moral precepts? Yes, yes, absolutely yes. Um, I just am not focused on that in our discussion, but thank you for that. That's very important and actually in the in the eightfold path if you look at it more sequentially you have to start with your right view and your right you know your right intention you have to work through your sila and then it's you get into the actual practices so thank you for that uh i don't you you say well whether you focus more on deepening sila and then later go to developing your uh meditation 
or you just bring sila in from the beginning as you're meditating, but it should, I hope, bring in the morality. Um, and that takes many forms. It's all the qualities of the heart, empathy, kindness, mm -hmm. love. I mean, there's so much in addition to sila. So thank you for that. Very important. Okay, um, let me just check one more time. Okay. By the way, on, as we go through these lists, it's important to look for yourself. Do you think in terms, it's, I think it is uh, important to have reflected on these teachings and these lists. But um, then you'll see for yourself how much keeping those lists in mind as a particular system or structure is works for you or how much you don't think about the list. Maybe you just whatever you practice is you just do mindfulness of breathing and, and, and you're not thinking in terms of them so much. So you'll find your own relationship with these lists. That's very important. All right. So there's more there if you want to spend more time, but I want to move now. Um, So let me just back up. So I'm looking at the time. We've been going for just under an hour. We're going to go about half an hour more and take a 10 minute break. My intention for what I'd like to do for the rest of our time here is go through two more lists real quick. Uh, Satipatthana Sutta for Foundation of Mindfulness and Anapanasati Sutta. Very important. And then I want to talk about jhana. And particularly, we're going to look at jhana in the Pali Suttas in detail. Next time, next week, we'll look at jhana in the Vasudhi Maga, and then we'll bring it all together, looking at all the controversies and everything like that. That's kind of an overview. Okay, well then let's move on. I, you know, I, I, I'm aware, like I know all this stuff well, and it feels like a lot of information to me coming out today. So uh, just take a moment. I hope it's not like frying your <laughs> frying your brain or anything. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. Um, it can be that way. But we're kind of, you know, just having this format, I think we can do a lot in our six hours, but it's just going to be a lot of info. So I hope you let what needs to stick, stick the rest. You can always come back to it and slow it down. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna keep talking then because I don't see any more people waving their hands. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so many of you will be aware and know about one of the suttas that gets a lot of attention in the insight meditation tradition, which is called, they translate it as the four foundations of mindfulness. It's actually, it's another tongue twister um, Pali name, which is sati, there's that word sati, mindfulness, sati patana. It doesn't really mean four, it just means foundation. They actually don't, it's, 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 they actually don't know how to translate it. Uh, the scholars have disagreements on, but um, if you ever read Ajahn Tanisro's book, Wings to Awakening, he's translating the Sati Patan as wings, supports, but it's foundations, it's foundations of mindfulness, Sati Patana. There are four of them. Um, there's a lot in those suttas. And so uh, let me just give you a little warning that I'm gonna try to just quickly name what the four are, just so you've heard it. Don't worry, it's, it's too much. It's not gonna stick in it. You know, one thing that happens at some point, it's just all there over time. If you're interested in studying this stuff, you don't have to. And then you, when you need it, it's just there. And it's all, you see how it fits together. But sometimes if you're new to it, man, it's just a lot of, a lot. So this sutta's kind of like that. Yes, Jeff. Please unmute. Yeah, go ahead, please. I just want to say you're doing a great job. You are clarifying a lot of really minute questions that have come up for me as I have studied and practiced this. So you're doing a fine job of answering these little sort of nitpicky questions. But 
Uh, okay. It's great. I'm yeah, great. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm very happy to hear that. Much better than if I was being a um, confusion generator. So, um, <laughs> so th <coughs> thank you for the feedback, and um, all feedback is welcome because. Um, Look, we're in a group of 100 people, no matter who's the teacher and no matter what you do, it's not going to be a perfect match in the style of what we're doing for everyone. So I'm tr hopefully we make it as useful as possible for the most number of people. So thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll try not to talk too quickly on this. The four foundation of mindfulness. And then we want to see where does samadhi fit into that? <clears throat> so... Um, this is a practice, a how-to meditation practice texts. And basically what it does is it, it's telling you, giving you instructions on how to use your mindful. But let me back up. What do we mean by the word mindfulness, sati? I think we should stay there for a moment. <clears throat> I'm going to give you my take on it. <clears throat> if you listen to... Um, some people will call it um, paying attention in a conscious way to something. That sort of, right? That's the practice of mindfulness. What's the mental state of mindfulness? My definition is um, not being spaced out on automatic pilot, knowing what's happening. So sometimes people will say, as we go through our day, you just get caught up in things and people will say, oh, you went unconscious, you lost your mindfulness. We know what they mean. You didn't really go unconscious, but you just are just lost in, in it. And I call that being on automatic pilot. And then something can happen where we sort of wake up out of that and we just know oh, consciously, purposely what's going on. We have mindfulness in the moment. So that's my own definition, just not being on automatic pilot. Um, one of the big, some of you will know this, the big benefits of that comes from a meditation practice is we're on, we're, without even trying, we're on automatic pilot um, less and less and less. doesn't mean you never space out. But it, and when you do, you're less deeply lost in it and everything. So that's a great benefit, uh, many benefits, but that's a good one. Uh, differences in mindfulness versus awareness. Uh, hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't. I don't mean to be glib or dismissive. Whatever. Uh, uh, for Bob, that, it's a good question. Um, I think we'd have to spend a lot of time kind of teasing that out. I. I, I don't know. Um, so the practice of mindfulness is that when you, when you go to meditate, you're doing some method, technique, practice. So you're doing something. You're putting your attention in a certain way. You're bringing your mindfulness to apply it in a certain way. The first foundation of mindfulness out of the four is called mindfulness of the body. And um, it's... And it's divided you don't have to remember all this stuff but it's it's in i think it's in, there in your texts uh but you can look there's so many places to look up if you want to go deeper into this online it's divided into six sections the first of the six is mindfulness of breathing and um it's even divided into four little sections on how you breathe you be mindful of breathing in of breathing out it gives you a little detail of how to do it because the breath is an experience in the body so mindfulness of breathing. The second mindfulness of the body practice is called the, um, um, there's the uh, four postures, uh, whether you're um, sitting, standing, um, uh, walking or lying down, right? You can, you can, um, there is, um, uh, so, it, so you can meditate according to this in any of these postures. So it's talking about that. There's just lots of different ways to be aware of the body. I'm not going to go through maybe all the six of them. One of them uh, um, is you break the body down into constituent parts. And there's actually a uh, part of seeing the body is composed of like 
there's a list of 31 or 32, depending on the list, um, bones, um, fat, uh, muscle, I mean, it goes through. So you can, there's a lot of different ways. There's four elements practices. There's some, there's even a practice of, um, we don't do it here in the West so much about a body, a dead body in various stages of decay. If you live in a country where there's charnel grounds, where they're waiting to burn the bodies and the bodies will stay out, people will go meditate on them. There's all these different things of ways to be uh, mindful of your body. But most people will probably take this as mindfulness of the breath and just being able to bring mindfulness in many different ways to, to know what's going on in your body. That for now, that's enough, uh, just a, an idea. The second f foundation of mindfulness <laughs> is a word with a V, Vedana. So uh, if, if, if they say Pali with a Burmese accent, they do it with a W, they'll, a Burmese accent is Vedana. But the most the international standard Pali is v, Vedana, it's just so you don't get confused on when they pronounce it. Vedana is sometimes pronounced as feeling tone, but be careful, it doesn't mean feelings like moods or emotions. It just means a, accompanying every experience there's the quality of it being pleasant or unpleasant. Sometimes also they'll call it neutral. I don't really like it. It's, it's neither pleasant nor unpleasant. So I'll ex that's the second. You'll notice the actual pleasantness of the experience, the unpleasantness or that it's kind of in between. So we've got mindfulness of the body, Vedana, we'll call it feeling tone. The third one is called chittas, it's consciousnesses. And it's a very specific list. It's not just pure awareness. It's talking about states that can arise in the mind. And I forgot the exact list, but like, is greed, hatred, and delusion present or, un or not present? Is uh, your mind concentrated or not concentrated? There's, there's more lists, but it's just noting the quality of your mind. I don't want to go through the whole list necessarily. You can look it up. Uh, um, and then the, the, um, the fourth foundation is complicated because it's a whole list of, of other lists. So you, you may not have known this. There are lists of lists. It just goes on and on. It doesn't quit. So there's lists of lists. And um, the, fourth, the fourth foundation of mindfulness goes through some of these important lists and tells you how to practice. Um, there's what's called uh, the sixth sense. Sense doors, I'll just name them, meaning they call it sense bases or sense doors. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting. They call it touch, which is just body sensations. And then what's going on in the mind is one. They call it a mind door because you can have experience in the mind. How do you work with those? It talks about it. Um, there's some other lists that I don't want to go through the whole thing. Um, hindrances, uh, I'll just mention it. Anyways. Um, so anyway, um, five aggregates, if you don't know what that is, um, let me ask me or you can look that up easily. Four Noble Truths is in that the fourth foundation of mindfulness. So how are we supposed to practice with the four foundations of mindfulness? People are all over the map of how they teach it and how you practice it and how you can experience it. And there are, believe it or not, Buddhists, you know, we're supposed to be so... Um, loving and kind and accepting. There are, I mean, there are Dharma wars out there. And actually I can show you an ancient text that says, if you don't interpret, I won't get into the details, this particular text and practice in this particular way, you're going to hell. What's up with these Buddhists? But they didn't know any better. They really thought this is the right way and I've got it and everybody else is wrong. And to this day, I'm not gonna name any names, but I can. There are plenty of people out there teaching a great path, wonderful paths of practice. But they're saying we've got the best, the right, the only way. This is the way the Buddha really taught. Well, guess what? The Buddha didn't teach in just one way. He did in all of the above because what's needed for each person is not is individual. Some people better be doing jhana practice. That's what they need. And other people should not go anywhere near jhana practice because that's not what they need. They need a bare insight practice. And they all get to the same place. Very, very important. So 
how do we practice and teach with, with, um, uh, with the Satipatthana? I'll just name a couple of ways, but you could take it again as prescriptive or descriptive. Prescriptive is saying pick, work your way through, pick just one foundation or start with one and work through them all, however you want to do it, and pick it as a practice and do that. That's prescribing what to do. Another way, which has been more the way has been my own practice, is it's descriptive. It's describing what happens if you just, if you just start with the first, my whole practice for 53 years has been mindfulness of breathing meditation. I still, I still keep up my practice to this day. Um, I don't know what happened if I stopped. I, I haven't done the experiment. Um, but um, I've been pleased with the results, I'll say this. That doesn't mean it has to be your practice, but my practice has been mindfulness of breathing. Every, what I found is through doing that and you get the samadhi and it opens to an inclusion of samadhi is the way mine, I could, I, I know yeah, exclusive also, which is, you know, that's kind of fun too, but uh, you get into an e e inclusive samadhi deep, everything else is there. It opens up if something else is, so let me ask you a question. For those of you who, who meditate, some of you won't re re relate to this, but some either in daily life or on retreats, either way is good. Isn't it true that when you start to settle your mind more, you don't have to go looking. If something's going on in the body, you know it more clearly than ever because you're undistracted with an inclusive samadhi, right? If there's something going on in your mind, I mean, we can go, get lost and caught up in it, sure. But if there's something going on in the mind, you know it. If something's unpleasant, you know it. So I'm not saying this is better. It's just one way you can think of it as a descriptive that all you have to do is settle the mind and everything else comes there. And so that's, as we get, this is sort of a little preview as we get into next week. One way to think about samadhi practice is, is that it in, includes mindfulness, insight, the heart qualities. John, it all comes into one thing. Other people, that's just not what they're drawn to and they'll pick different specific aspects and just focus on it. I like that. So it's not one way. Now, in the fourth foundation of this, oh, one more thing, the Satipatthana Sutta appears in two places in the Pali texts, in what's called the middle length discourses, the Majjhima Nikaya, if you want to know in Pali. It's got, I think, 152 uh, suttas in it. And they're middle length because they're all like, they're not super short or super long. Long, three or four, ten pages. Satipatthana Sutta appears in the middle length suttas. It appears again in the long discourses, the Dikkha Nikaya, because they're a bunch of longer ones, called the Maha, the great Maha Satipatthana Sutta. And it's identical to the, the other Satipatthana Sutta, except in the very end, when it talks about the Four Noble Truths, it expands out the Eightfold Path in a lot of detail. And it's, that's when it gets into uh, uh, jhana. It actually goes through the whole thing of bringing jhana in a lot of detail into the definition. Again, it's just another emphasis on right samadhi of the Eightfold Path being jhana. Well, if you take that, then what the Satipatthana Sutta is saying there, it's, it's not saying you have to practice it in one way or another, but put in together with everything else, I think it's aiming towards, and that's been my experience. You just start with, you start with uh, the breath and get more concentrated, concentrated. The heart opens in love, which is really nice when that happens. Isn't it better when, when the heart's in love? It is, it just feels better. Uh, kindness, empathy, you get, you get all the good, you know, kind of blissful feelings. It's nice, your mind's clear, present. You know what's happening in the body. You know the Vedna. You know the states of your mind. You get all of that. However, people get to the same, and by the way, it culminates in equanimity again, but people get the same level of equanimity if they never do jhana. That may be some of you. Just by doing the insight part.
that's a practice question. Vedna feeling tones are about as far as I can get when in concentration. Those three feeling tones open up a lot of grasping. That's more a, you know, it's a comment that we're asking, but um, this is where you look to see what's actually happening in your practice and then how do I work with it? So that's a how-to question. So anyway, uh, the, the bottom line is on the Satipatthana Sutta, it doesn't explicitly say jhana, but samadhi's in there. And probably, again, undistracted, I think the Satipatthana Sutta is kind of interested in getting as undistracted as you can without stressing out about it. Don't, please don't create a lot of suffering in this path and intending to come to an end of suffering. Don't stress out about getting undistracted. Just be relaxed and easeful, but, but aim yourself in that way. I think that's what Satipatthana is talking about. Before we break, I'm going to say something about the Anapanasati Sutta, which is also very important. Well, it'll be shorter. Okay, I was just reading it. How long does it take to get to jhanas? Understand it varies, but do you have some average times? Uh, no, um, highly individual. We'll say more about that uh, uh, next week. Uh, highly individual. Uh, there are people who can get into jhana through daily life practice, never have to do retreats. Probably most people probably do it more in the retreat context, but um, um, I know and work with a number of people who uh, can can get into those states in their daily life practice. So um, other people say, no, no, you can't do that, but it's not true. So um, that, that'll be a, oh, Buddhists from other countries, this is getting off topic, but it's a good topic. Buddhists from other countries have suggested American Buddhism is not real Buddhism. And as a member of American society, I can see that they are likely noticing the way our culture blindly appropriates other spiritual traditions. Where is the development of humility in American Buddhism regard, in this regard? So I appreciate that, uh, that question, that comment. And what I would say about that is throughout the history of Buddhism, it has always, as it spread and moved into other countries and cultures, it's brought in with it from whatever the source culture that it came in from. And then it always melded with the local cultures and traditions. This is always is what's happened and become a new thing, its own. So when you think of as Buddhism moved, say, out of uh, India, <clears throat> this is more the Mahayana versions later and moved into China uh, in the form, say, Chan Buddhism. Um, it took the Chinese a number of centuries actually to um, uh, realize it, but what had happened was it became it's a new thing. It's not bet less than or worse than, it's its, it's, its own. Th One person, by the way, there's a book out there titled The Buddhist Religions, plural, by uh, Ajahn Tanisaro, and it argues that we shouldn't think of Buddhism as a religion, but as a family of religions that trace themselves back to a single origin. It's an interesting book, The Buddhist Religions. <clears throat> you don't have to read it. I just sort of gave you the, the bottom line, but that's if you're interested. So when it moved into the, it, it's, it, it brought a particular flavor. Remember I said of the early Buddhism, uh, a lot of the early schools had died out, more Mahayana flavors that were evolving. Those are the versions, um, um, a particular school called the Sarvastivada school, uh, moved in uh, to Tibet, it moved into China. And so Tibetan Buddhism feels real Tibetan. Chan Buddhism feels real Chinese. That Chan is what then, by the way, the word Chan, the word Jhana, by the word, the word Jhana, when we get to it, it just means to meditate. But we, it, it, it means something special, but the, just, the word just means meditation. When it went into Chinese, jhana in Sanskrit is dhyana, in Chinese is chan. Chan Buddhism is the jhana school of Buddhism. In Japanese, Soto Zen, Zen jhana, is, is the Japanese of it. So Zen is the jhana school of Buddhism. So just in case you're interested in that. So it's always changing. Japanese Zen feels really Japanese and it's took what came from India through China into Japan, and now it took the Chinese and then it melded with Japanese culture. So the same thing is happening here. And this is, maybe it's controversial and other people may have different takes. I'm just giving you my take. That doesn't mean it's right. Or you, if you disagree, it's fine. I'm just offering my own for whatever it's worth. 
Um, you could argue, and people do, that something's being lost in the way we're changing the Dharma as it's coming to the West. I totally argue that. You can ar also argue that something's gained as it's becoming sort of more culturally, and we're not just one culture in this country, so I want to be really careful, but just as a way of speaking, uh, you know, we brought in a lot of the psychological aspects there. Um, there's a lot of things that make it so you could argue that really something's gained and it, for our time and our culture or that something's been lost. And I don't want to get more off into that. But um, those are all that's those are fun. You know, I've had a lot of those discussions. It's kind of fun to do that. One more thing. There's another sutta called the Anapana Sati. There's that word Sati, my sutta. <clears throat> And it's a real important sutta also. It's kind of equal in, to the Satipatthana Foundation of Mindfulness Sutta in importance in, in, the, in the tradition. Anapana, ana means in-breathing, pana means out-breathing. In-breathing and out-breathing, mindfulness of breathing sutta is how it's translated. It's a very interesting sutta, just as an aside, <clears throat> it begins <clears throat> excuse me, it begins with the Buddha is there, uh, and thus have I heard, this is Ananda speaking, the Buddha's there with all the practitioners, I think he's with the monks, you know, they, uh, the, the women were there, but it was a different culture and time, so I'm sorry, it was the guys, and um, they were all hanging out, and, um, you know, if the Buddha were here today, we don't know how he'd be about all that stuff, but I suspect it would be a little more modern in his views but anyway so he's there with the guys and he goes around and he looks at all these different groups and he says here's some people practicing um and he you know doing meta meta i don't remember the whole this meta practice foundation of mindfulness practice um the seven factor of enlightenment he lists all these different ways they're practicing and he says he's approving of all of them he says because they're each practicing according to their own, and I forgot how he says it, temperaments, what works best for them. And he says it's all good. So right there, we've got the Buddha himself saying it's not one way. If anybody ever tells you uh, they've got the true right way, yeah, if you feel like it, you might just gently say, well, you know, there's this sutta you might want to go look at because um, I don't think that's what the Buddha was saying. But anyway, um, and then he says, now let me tell you my way of, of practicing. Or another way, I don't say his, his, well, actually, every time I can think of that the Buddha is referred to talking about his own practice, when he said, this is what I do, he said, mindfulness of breathing. That's not holding it up as better than anything else. That's just kind of his thing, right? But uh, just an aside, so he starts to talk about mindfulness of breathing. And what this sutta basically does, it's another complicated sutta, it divides um, meditation practice into 16 steps. I'm not going to go through the 16 steps. We don't have the time to do that, but it's Anapanasata Sutta. Uh, if you have, some of you have my book, it's in there. There's lots of resources you can find. Um, I didn't list out all the, it's just too much in the notes here, um, but it's easy to find this, you know, mindfulness of breathing sutta, Anapanasati. You can get to all of them. And there's many commentaries and many different approaches of how it's taught. It's not one way. What it does is it divides the 16 steps into four groups, four tetrads. The first group is um, the exact four steps from the mindfulness of Satipatthana, the mindfulness of breathing. The very first one I said it was four, four steps on how to do your breath. It repeats them here. Breathing in, breathing out is a list of four. The second group really gets into more Vedana mind states and so on. It basically goes on to say that if you practice the, the, the Anapanasati, each tetrad fulfills each of the four mindfulness of uh, foundation of mindfulness. It says that, and I'm skipping over a lot of detail. But at the end, it says that. It goes, here's the steps. By doing them, you fulfill each of the four foundations of mindfulness. By fulfilling the four foundations of mindfulness, you complete and fulfill the seven factors of enlightenment. 
And by completing the seven factors of enlightenment, you come to a, uh, your liberation practice. That's the, that's the text. So that's kind of cool that it brings it all together kind of in one thing. Here are a few different ways that the Satipatthana Sutta gets, it's, it's, it's a big world. Here's a couple of ways to think about it. It can be prescriptive or descriptive. And it can be a samadhi practice or it can be a pure insight de-emphasizing samadhi. Take your pick. It's all good. Um, as prescriptive, it's saying, again, you start with step one. People will practice this way. If you, if you want to use this sutta as a, I've never used this sutta as a structure. I, I just know about it. And, um, but uh, for me, I've just started with step one, put my attention on my breathing, where I feel it, my body and all that. All the other steps just kind of fell out as you go deeper. It, it, it was more of a description of what happens. Other people you know, don't do it that way. They start, okay, I put my attention wherever. I, I point to my nose. That's kind of where in the nasal passages is my spot. Anywhere in your body is fine. doesn't matter. Um, oh, breathing in long, I, I know. So I, they start to notice I'm mindful. I'm breathing in long. Breathing in short, you know that. They work through the steps. Again, we're not, we, this is an Anapanasati class, so I'm not going to go through all the steps. Look them up for yourself. I'm going to put in the chat on the break how you can contact me if you, I'm not looking to try to get you to contact me, I, I, but um, I do want to make, I'll be as available if, if 91 people do, we'll have to kind of do the best I can, <laughs> but um, um, I do want to support you um, um, the best I can if, 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 if that's helpful. So you can, I can point you to some of that stuff. Um, You work through the steps systematically. That's prescriptive, descriptive. You can do all those steps not thinking about John or Samadhi, just, just a light level of undistractedness. And people get tremendous benefit out of that. For others, it's been more, I've been more of a Samadhi guy. So, uh, you know, the Samadhi just comes in and is in there. So that's been my own personal experience. But, you know, one of the great benefits that you find it for those of you, you, you if you either are in a teacher role or if you ever end up in a teacher role, just one of the great um, gifts is, is that you really see, not just as a nice idea, but how, yes, we're all the same, but how different we all are. And, and I got to tell you, this is a little true confession. I don't tell this out there because it's a little embarrassing, but when I was the newest and the youngest, when I knew the least, I was the most opinionated about what was right and wrong. I had no idea what I was talking about. I wouldn't say that out loud because you just come off being kind of a jerk, right? You can't do that. But I thought it. How are you supposed to meditate? What's right? I was the worst. Over time, thankfully, I got to see, not just as a good idea, not just being politically correct, it's really true. It's just such a diverse word out, world out there. And that's the good news because, again, you can't mess it up. You want to listen. So I'm going off on a little Dharma talk. You've got to want to listen to your own inner teacher and your inner guidance. Follow that. Sometimes we can't distinguish between our own delusion or our greed, hatred, and delusion, and we think it's our inner wisdom. Okay, fine. But, but we get better at it. We get to distinguish more. Follow your teaching, listen to others, let them, and then try it on and see, and the way will reveal itself. And I bet you if we went around, and I could, we don't have time to do it, it'd be kind of fun. Uh, I guarantee in this group, there's 92 of us here. We are all over the place. But everybody here, I know you wouldn't be here is bringing a sincere intention. That's what's going to serve you take you through. Just stay in touch with our good intention, right? However, it's good to get clear. And when we come back from the great break, we're going to go into, uh, so anyway, that was, sorry, that was necessarily way too little on the Anapanasati Sutta. That could be a lifetime. Any one of these lists could be a lifetime 
of exploration and inquiry. And it would be worth it if that's what you're drawn to. You, you, it's there, you just no end to how far you can take it. For today, we're just naming a few things. I have to get, be honest, all of that when I wrote my book, that was just a sales pitch to say, you see, Samadhi and Jhana really is a big deal. And all you insight people out there who uh, um, kind of don't emphasize it, it's like, you're wrong. <laughs> I might have a little bit of that in my mind. So anyway, um, of course, they're not wrong. It's just different. All right, let's do this. Um, it's 1030 now. I'm going to break for 10 minutes. And of course, you come All right, so welcome back, and I assume others will come in and join as they're ready. Um, just before we go, a uh, couple of things here. There's somebody sent a chat. Do you recommend a way of judging this breath as long and this that breath is short? So um, I don't. So since I don't know you, I'd have to talk to you one-on-one -on -one in your practice. Um, but please don't overthink it. The idea, and this may not be what you meant, so I hope, but just in case, it's not that you have to get it right, like is a long one or short, and figure it out in your mind. Uh, just experience your breath as you're experiencing it. I think when it says, most people will say, if it's long or if it's short, you don't have to make it long and short. It's just staying with the breath and experiencing. It's just to keep with the breath. That's the way to do it. So really, you know, these texts were preserved in this formalized language and this formalized structure. Um, but um, I've never heard anybody, and, and I, 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 I don't either, uh, think you have to know if it's a long or a short breath it's just fine if if you if you use mindfulness of breathing and and, and again um that's a powerful practice lots of people do it it may be the the single most common practice but if 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 mindfulness of breathing by the way is not a good practice for you there's nothing wrong there's a no, lot of reasons uh why breath's not good for something you know i knew someone who had uh, a choking incident as a child and so every time they put their attention to the breath it actually brought up like some or some trauma or, you know, they would get constricted kind of a thing. So many other practices, just like in this four foundations of mindfulness and uh, many, many practices that are equal as powerful and everything. Uh, there's other reasons. So, but um, just connect with your breathing, where you feel it in your body. Don't overthink it, however you experience it. Just, it, it, this is more of a practice question, but anyway. Um, let me just say this, um, I think I, everybody this I, I i sent it to it says meeting group chat i guess that went to everyone but i put something in the chat hopefully if you're interested you could see it i said you may or may not be interested but um if you are i gave you an email you can that's our organization if you want to get on our email list uh, you're welcome we you if you don't receive an email for a long time don't worry we don't send them out very often one or two or three times a year um you can get our email list to find out about retreats that we teach their John retreats, or uh, if you want to contact me, that's an email also that will work. So hopefully those who wanted to see it can see that. And let me just check if there's any more questions here, or hands up. Okay, I'm going to continue then. Now we're going to start in on a particular flavor of Samadhi called Jhana, J-H-A-N-A. Um, so first of all, um, I said before the word jhana in the texts, we should just mention it just, the word just translated means meditation. There are a couple of places in the suttas where actually there's a wrong jhana. Uh, there's one where the Buddha is telling a story when before he switched over to the kind of practice that, that he ended up doing, he was doing all these yogic practices. And one of them, he could, he would hold his breath. It was like doing these ascetic practices. He would hold his breath for these really long periods of time. I'm not sure what the purpose was. 
and that was described as what you call a wrong jhana. So, but almost every place where the word jhana is used in the text, it's specifically referring to what we are going to talk about as jhana. And in the Pali text, the, the, the definition is given of, of, there's a definition given in the text. And by definition, any meditative state that, ma jhana is whatever matches these words. That's what jhana is, what these words say is what it is. So what I want to do is, um, I, on page six of your notes, I've actually printed out an English translation of the jhana definition. Um, I should say that, um, just, just to clarify in case there's ever any confusion, this is my own translation. Um, it's a good translation, and I, but everybody makes certain choices. And so just to say, if you were to read uh, some other translation, that sometimes there'll be a little difference, just so you know. Um, and um, one of the reasons is, is that there are some places, like if you look at the wisdom publications, say, with, where Bhikkhu Bodhi, who's a great, you know, I, I'm not on, I'm okay, was an okay translator in my day, but he, I'm not, not like him, a great scholar. Um, he did some different things, but he made some stylistic choices. I'm sure he had, I've spoken with him about this. He had good reasons. I tried to stick to the more literal meanings. That was just my own choices. So um, what I'm going to do is um, we're going to work, go through this and try to really, because we have to tease it out. Sometimes if we're in person, just to get some extra voices in here, we'll ask other people to read some of this, but I'm just going to do it because there's so many of us. And so you can read along. I'm just going to read on page six. It says, John, a definition. So this is it. And I'm just going to read the first sentence and then we're going to pause. It says, you can just read along or listen, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk, and it does use the word monk there. Bhikkhu is the word it uses in Pali. A monk enters and abides in the first jhana, which is characterized by rapture and pleasure born of seclusion and accompanied by thought and examination. Clear? No, it's not clear at all. What the heck does that mean? One of the, we're going to go through it, uh, and you'll look at the other four, the other three, um, where we'll go through them one by one also. Um, one of the reasons that there's so much, we're talking about Dharma Wars when it comes to jhana, there are so many people teaching, this is the real jhana, the right jhana, that's okay if that teacher wants to teach that. Every one of these different teachers can legitimately be claiming to teach an authentic jhana because there are many different states that match the verbal description here, right? Because it's very subjective. So before we go through this, let, we're going to back up just for a sec. Oh, I, wait a minute. If you also look on page seven, so if you, sorry, if you look on page six, there's four sentences. One does, so there's four jhanas, first, second, third, and fourth. And each one has a sentence here that, that defines it. We'll read them all together and go through them. About half the places in the suttas where um, the definition appears, it's just this. About the other half, it's, it gives the exact definition, but they include a simile with it, which are very beautiful. And it, it, we're going to go and read it with the similes in a, in a moment, um, but um, in a few minutes. Just so you know, also, when I said the, the definition's my own translation, the simile is not my translation. That's Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. Um, so, before we go through this, I want to um, back up and, well, first let's just notice, sorry, I'm getting a little scattered here. Let me, let me, uh, 
settle down here a little bit. In this first definition, let's just look at the beginning. It says, quite secluded from sensual pleasures. All that means is, I'm sure many of you know this for your own practice, in order to meditate, you need to kind of set aside external distractions, just enough to kind of be able to, that's why some people go on retreats, or it can serve people, say you're at home practice, if, if you can have kind of not so much commotion going all around you, you sort of set aside a, a place where it can be a little more conducive to the meditation. That's all it's talking about. It doesn't have to be perfect. But if someone's doing a construction project right out and got a jackhammer going right outside your window, it might be harder. Actually, when you get to a certain place in Samadhi, you'll find out it doesn't matter if the jackhammer is going, there's no distraction. It can be like that. But we want to set up supportive conditions. That's all that means. So you're secluded from sense pleasures and then secluded from unwholesome states. This is going back to the seven factor, to that thing that said, everybody who's ever become enlightened or ever will, remember there were three steps. You set aside the hindrances and then you practice the four foundation of mindfulness so you could fulfill the seven factors of enlightenment. That first step, bringing down the hindrances. That's what it means secluded from unwholesome states. You need to be able to settle down enough. You can have stuff going on. It's all right. Many of you know this. Doesn't have to be perfect. But we've got to bring the storm clouds of the mind down enough, even if it's just for a few minutes, to be able to settle. That's all it's talking about. And then it says you enter in the first John. It doesn't tell you how to do it. But um, some of these other texts we're telling you about mindfulness of breathing and things. But and then it says, here's what it's characterized. Now we're going to get into these terms. What do they mean? It says rapture and pleasure. So we'll look and say, what do they really mean by that? And it says born of the seclusion. So because you secluded yourself, meaning just temporarily, I, I went in the other room. Someone's got the TV on in here. I'm going to go in the other room. You seclude. That's all it is. And then as you've done that, um, you've gotten in this first John, it's got some qualities there, rapture and pleasure. And it's accompanied by something that I've translated as thought and examination. So there's some state that you enter that is pointing towards. So what's the nature of this jhana that we're talking about? Um, well, in other places, not in the definition, but in other places in the sutta, and I listed something called the uh, Mahavedala Sutta, which is down towards the bottom of page six in your notes. It says that the Mahavedala Sutta specifies certain elements from the definition, and they call them jhana factors. So you will hear people talk about the jhana factors a lot, depending on the teacher. I don't use that term myself when I'm teaching much, but most people probably do. And um, I list um, uh, at the bottom of page six and the pop top of page seven, I list the factors. What I call rapture and pleasure. And what I call thought and examination, they're all there. We're getting ready to get into it. And on the top of page seven, I talk about what's called unification of mind. So let's go through those factors because this is the quality of jhana that we're going to be talking about. What is it to be in the state of jhana? Again, we're not right now getting in how do you get there. That's a more practice question, a big question. So if you go to the top of um, page seven, there's this term ekagata, which, sorry, that's, uh, where did I list it? I didn't actually spell that out on your notes there. The eka means one. So this jhana factor, ekagata, uh, so in the second jhana, they do use the term these eka, but they call it ek ekodi bhava, which means the being in a state of this oneness, this eka. But ekagata, which I should have put it in the note there, uh, which is the jhana factor, this goes back to what we said at the very beginning today, when we, you, eka means one, so it's translated as one-pointedness. 
singleness, that's single, singleness of mind, or unification, uni, one, that we talked about earlier. So again, the, this ekagata is, there's more than one way. This is going to get, when we get into the controversies later about what's jhana, there's more than one flavor of ekagata. The exclusive one-pointedness ekagata or the unification of mind, which is just as deep, it's not less deep, but where we haven't shut off the flow of changing experience. The mind itself has stopped, not the flow of changing experience, right? That's the, the other kind of, so there's two, already we've got two kind of flavors that can be jhana. And you can experience both of these flavors from a practice point of view. Okay. Here's the way I think about it. This is not, this is a very clumsy analogy, but um, it's probably a little inaccurate, but it's, I'm just not being as articulate as I wish I could be. Um, so hopefully it will work for you. If you've got water on a, and it's a wintry day and it's outdoors and things are getting colder and colder and maybe the water's starting to freeze and, I, I don't know if it really works this way, but you'll get the idea. And then it hasn't turned to ice, but it's maybe starting to get a little slushy. It's settling more and more. And it's getting more slushy. And, you know, so when we're concentrating, the mind can get more and more settled. We can, it can still wobble. We can still go off, but not as much. We're getting more and more concentrated. You're getting deep in it. But it can still move a little. But at some point, that water turns to ice and it's fixed, it's not moving. I don't know if it clunks into ice, the mind doesn't really go clunk, but it kind of, kind of be settling, settling, and all, all of a sudden, and the mind stops. That's the level of ekagata, whether one-pointed, exclusive on the object, or the mind and unification, the mind unmoving. That's, a pow that's the clear force pool, and it's a powerful place to be in the level of insight and mindfulness and awareness has just gotten magnified tremendously because of the clarity and the undistracted of the mind is so powerful. That's the level we're talking about of ekagata in jhana that we're talking about. But it, it's along with that, there's other things happening. So we're going to talk about what I call rapture and pleasure. If you know, sometimes you'll hear people talk about what's called did I put it in Pali? I did. So um, the Pali is um, piti, P-I-T-I, -I, pronounced with a long I, P-T, like P-E-E-T-E-E. -E -E -E. That's the pronunciation, P-T. It, when you look up the, all I looked up, I did a whole list of all, maybe I put it in here. I didn't go through it all here of all the different ways I could look up where people have translated PT. People call it bliss, rapture, pleasure. There's like a bliss, rapture, pleasure. I'm, I'm forgetting a few, but it's like you're blissed out kind of a thing. Okay, that's the PT. I wanna come back to that in a minute. Then there's one called Sukha which is normally translated as happiness or sometimes pleasure. Oh, and PT can be happiness too. They mix them all up. Um, so what does that mean? You're having some kind of pleasant experience here. Well, um, it turns out that even in the deepest jhana, it's highly individual how PT is experienced because we're all different. And in fact, this is important point. The Pali suttas never, ever, ever explain what PT is. They just use the term. Not one place in the suttas does it actually tell you what they're talking about. So people are going to say PT is this or it's that. Well, the suttas never said that. They must have had some shared understanding back there. When we get to the Vasudhi Maga next week, they go into a lot of detail very specifically about what PT is, not the Pali suttas. So let me just, for some people, this rapture, this pleasure, this bliss can be very intense. It can be like a powerful, like 
this energy of bliss moving in your body or it can be more mental. And sometimes PT can actually be too much and it can feel like if you've ever gotten electric shock or something, it's too much. It can be raggedy and jangly even. There's ways we can bring it down and practice and smooth it out. It can all easily be worked with, but so it's, it can be too much. We need, that's part of the skill or if you're working with a teacher of how you, how you manage that. Or it can be very light and sweet and never that strong of a, of a blissful feeling ever. In fact, as you're going to see when we get in the deeper jhanas, PT drops away completely because things settle out. All that PT feels a little too coarse. But you're having some kind of pleasant experience. Again, it can be very light and everybody's going, where's my bliss? That's not how PT is for you. The ekagata, the unification of mind, or the one point is just as deep, but it's more smoothed out even from the beginning. So the important thing is not looking at some teacher, some book, or some whatever is telling you this is how it is. The question is, how is it for you? That is right, correct PT, because that's what you're getting. Sukha is generally um, talked about as being, it's, it's a little lighter stage. It's more, instead of bliss, it's more of a happiness, more of a, of a pleasure. It's kind of a little more smoothed out of a pleasantness. These can be felt both in the body or they can be kind of mental, PT and Sukha. Now, some teachers, yeah, so, sorry, I, uh, at Cody Bhava, it meant being or becoming, right, about jewels, that's right, uh, becoming or being unified or one-pointedness, so that's exactly uh, right. Um, about about a Cody Bhava, I thought Bhava meant being or becoming, not mine. Yes, I, I, I may have misspoken. I don't remember what I said, but that's exactly right. So um, um, some people think PT and Sukha are these two separate things, and that's fine. There's this PT, and when the PT kind of settles out, then the Sukha is more, the sukha is more subtle. I don't view them that way. For To me, they're just a part of a continuum of things get settled out and get less strong and it kind of gets subtler and sweeter and a little lighter and I call that the sukha but that's me so other people will say that's different so you'll just hear different people talking about these it doesn't really matter there's different manifestations of this pleasantness let me name a few other things that are important here backing away from the pt and sukha for those of you who have done much meditation you know that as the mind settles, this is the concentration deepening. How is it you'll know, I'll come back to the definition in a minute, but let's step out for a moment. How is it you know that you're settling in deeper in the meditation? You're having some experience, right? That's telling you that. You're meditating, you're new, you're going, is something gonna happen? When is anything gonna happen or whatever? And then all of a sudden, someday you notice, oh, I, I feel myself being a little deeper in. It's You're not, asking yourself it's it's palpable there's no question it's experientially just you're deeper in what's the feeling of being deeper in well it's hard to describe but i'll just say a few adjectives you'll put in your own i can't cover everything you'll just feel your your mind is just there's a steadiness there a calmness there more of a stillness even a little bit your mind's not wandering as much you're just more of a sense of presence can be that that's one thing you some of the pleasant experiences can start to come, uh, whether you call it the PT or Sukha, maybe it's a little pleasant in the mind or just the feeling in the body or the mind. It just feels good. It does feel good when your mind settles. Listen, let me back up for a second. This stuff feels great. I'm not supposed to talk like this, but are they recording me. That's all right. I'm going to just tell you it's great. One of the things people will say, oh, don't try to develop jhana because you're going to get attached. You're going to crave after it. A lot of people do. It's good. They don't say, hold back on the metta, the loving kindness. Don't, don't really go for it as far as you can because you get attached. Don't hold, back on the, hold, hold, don't hold back on the mindfulness. Don't hold back on the insight, all these wholesome mind states. But for some reason, the samadhi piece that one you're going to get, got to hold back because you're going to get attached. Guess what? You are going to crave after it and you are going to get attached to it. It's no big deal. We'll pull you out. Don't worry. And 
you're going to suffer when you don't get it and you're going to learn to let go and you're going to learn that it's, it's not about any particular state the stakes are important that's what we're talking about here it's really about the liberation of your heart and mind that's not dependent on any state and it's the non-clinging with whatever actually is happening that's the path and so the best way to get jhana I'll just give you a little quick story. I was on this long, I've done a bunch of retreats. Uh, I did this one year long retreat. Now that's a long retreat. And I was like in the middle and I'd gotten into John over the years and a bunch of stuff. And so I had it all planned out. All right, this is going to be great. I'm going to go on retreat. Um, I'll be there about, about a month. I'm going to get into John and then it's going to just deepen and all this after that. Well, guess what? I'm four or five months in, no John. I'm freaking out. So I go to the teacher I was working with, Joseph Goldstein was the guy I was working with, you know who he is. I'm crying. And, and he said, well, you know, the real depth of the practice isn't attaining any particular state. It's the non-clinging with whatever's happening. And then I, I said to him, you think I'd know better. I said, yes, Joseph, of course that's true. But in order for me to realize that deeply, I got to get whatever. And then I proceeded to suffer for a while until I finally got it. And then in the deeper letting go, everything eventually gets where it needs to get. John, attaining John is not by doing, it's actually deep states of letting go. Um, just one second, Alex, uh, I'll come, is that okay? Can you hang on for a second? Yeah. So, um, I forgot even what I was talking about, uh, sorry. Uh, I'll get it back. Um, so we have all these experiences that come. You, if, if you start, some people start to see visual images or light. It can be very distinct spots or uh, diffuse. Not everybody, most people don't. Some people hear sounds. Um, you can feel very expansive. I've had experiences where I'm sitting in meditation and it felt literally like my body was the size of the room. And I'm sitting there saying, I know my body hasn't actually, but and now I'm going to peek and open my eyes. It's like, no, it's not. Close my eyes. It feels like I filled the room. You can have these experiences, expansiveness. So many experiences come when we start getting into samadhi. So the PT and sukha are part of these experiences. Maybe there's a light associated with it or a blissful feeling or just a pleasantness, just a kind of a nice feeling. It, it can be very subtle. This is the PT and the sukha. Okay, that it's going to come in some form. I'm going to go on to the next, but I want to stop. Stop, Alex. Why don't you go ahead if you had a uh, a comment or a question? Uh, please. I just want to uh, hi. I just want the clarification. So you said uh, one, you went on one year retreat, right? Four or five uh, months, no jhana. Which jhana are we talking about? The the light jhana, the samadhi jhana, or Visuddhimagga, the the hard jhana, the first jhana. What's the first jhana you're referring to? It's um, just um, it, 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 the image works for uh, for any John. No, no, for you to, for I, four or five years that you were not through. I mean, I don't know if you realize like this is very discouraging, right? Like, how many of us have a, a no. one year to uh, you know uh, to, to dedicate on retreat, right? And then like you know four or five months no John, and then like Listen, forget about John. One of the things I if I had to pick, well, then I shouldn't have brought that in, and I that was a that's okay. No, 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 it's problem. You know, it's fine. You oh, know, let me tell you something. I used to be super gigantic, big on retreats. I still. But I teach them. I think they're great. If this, what I'm about to say, I honestly, sincerely mean this. If I had to make a distinction between only daily life practice or retreat, absolutely slam dunk daily life practice. No question about it. Mm -hmm. I, I happen to be drawn because I wanted to, I was always big on retreats and did a few each year and I've done them for several months of retreats or shorter, longer. I wanted to know what happens if you take the time pressure off to see. Mm -hmm. All I really learned was uh, one thing on the whole retreat. This isn't anything, anything of value. Whenever you're clinging, you're suffering. Mm -hmm. When the mind learns to let go, you're at peace. That's it. That's the whole thing. So does it need All to the be rest is, I was just trying to make a point about clinging. It does. I do have some experience in the various versions of John. I was more, I tend naturally towards the unification of mind style. 
Uh, so that's kind of what I was talking about. But anyway, is that a good enough for now? Uh, so, so this distinction between the like daily life or uh, or retreat, can there be like I'm trying actually to do hybrid kind of like sure. I'm attending a three week retreat, but I'm also working and having normal life. So some yeah. type of hybrid uh, sure. is better or not? It's let me just tell you, this is literally true. Not just trying to be in. Oh, I am trying to be encouraging, but 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 this is true. Using what you have the best you can. Mm -hmm with your life circumstances is enough to get. And look, you can have it all. We're not supposed to talk like this, but, and by the way, the Buddha didn't say, don't get attached and everything. I, I, there's a lot of quotes. I'm paraphrasing. He didn't use this language. He said, go for it. He didn't say, hold back. He said, go for it. So, so how do you go for it without suffering? You incline yourself and practice in a way that has something you want to attain, but you don't make it an object of clinging and craving. The way you get ahead is, is you may have to fake it, but just is to not try to get anywhere, just to be here, but to use what's here well without trying, without thinking. And that's what moves your head the best. So you use what you have in life. There's no have to about this. I want to tell you there are people who get deep in samadhi and everything, and they have jobs and families, and, and, and I, I, because you get in the teacher role, these people, I guess because of my books, you know, people come to me and I talk with them. It's every, it's all over the place. It's not one way. Don't get discouraged, my friend. You've got to trust me on this. I'm a Buddhist. I can't lie. All right. Others have taught sandwich retreats, someone said. I think, thank you for bringing that up, where they'll take, maybe we should do one online. I've done it before. There's two weekends where you do all day, you're at home. Or maybe you'll show up in person somewhere. It doesn't have to be a Zoom these days. And then during the week, you have your, and, and each evening they'll meet and meditate and do some talks together. So um, really, so we can see, anyway, so uh, yeah. Um, all right, so um, PT and Sukha. Um, again, they weren't defined anywhere, so you can see it's, it's a big range because people experience them differently. The Ekagata is similar through all jhanas, but even there, there's two, at least two different, different kinds of Ekagata I've been talking about, of one-pointedness or unification. So there's a lot of flavors here. There are two more jhana factors that are even more problematic. And here they're called Vitaka Vichara. Again, if you hear the, the Burmese accent for Pali, it'll be we talk a we chara, if you hear that, but that's what they're talking about. Um, and um, so if you go to page, actually, sorry about this. If you go to page seven and eight, I forgot in the notes here. Let me, let me stop here for a second. If you go to page eight, you can see up at the top, I did give the different definitions there of uh, translations of PT. Rapture, bliss, joy, delight, zest, exuberance, and sukha, pleasure, happiness, joy, agreeable bliss. So you can see it's a big range on how people translate. And I do talk there about a kagata and the two different ways of where it's one pointedness of unification of mind on page eight. Let's go to the bottom of page seven, and then we'll move back up to the definition of simile. simile. The bottom of page seven. The bottom of page seven is this term vitaka vichara. Now I had a conversation once with Peter Skilling, who used to be the president of the Polytech Society and he's a, what was a, is, I don't know if he's still around, it's been years since I've spoken to him, well-known Pali and Sanskrit, but Pali scholar. And he said, of all these terms we're talking about, even more than PT and Sukha, Vitaka and Vichara are the most problematic and most difficult to get at the meaning, unknown of what they really meant. So at the bottom, just look at these two different, different, several definitions at the bottom of page seven in your notes. Or if you don't have the notes, just listen. Vitaka Vichara, by the way, Vitaka Vichara also, according to Peter Skilling and the way that they um, 
show up in the text should always be taken as a pair, not individually. That's what he said, and that's what it seems like. There is one place where vichara is one spot. It gets separated out in the suttas, but that's a specialized thing that we don't care about here. Vitaka vichara, here's some different translations. Reflection and investigation, thinking and pondering, thought and examination, applied and sustained thought, thought, conception, and discursive thinking, connecting and sustaining, initial and sustained mental application, directed thought and evaluation. These meanings are all over the place, okay? But you can roughly put all of these definitions into two main categories, and this is an important point to remember. One category is some level of thinking things through, reflecting on things, thinking, pondering, kind of um, um, thought and examination, that kind of mental activity. And the other group of a class of, def of definitions isn't about thinking things through, it's how we apply the attention, connecting and sustaining. That's a mental activity, but it's your just connect. That's when you put your attention on your breath, for example. You connect with the breath and you sustain it there. That's different than thinking things through and pondering, right? Different, totally different feeling. And this gives rise to different views, again, of what's happening in jhana. So, um, so we've got piti and sukha and this vitaka and char, vichara, how, however we um, use it. Um, the way in my definition, I called, if you go back up on page six there, when I, when I defined it, I said, rapture and pleasure. No, I said, accompanied by thought and examination. I'm not taking sides on the definition as opposed to connecting and sustaining. I think it's more to the literal sort of the etymology of the words and the literal meaning. So that's the only reason I picked that in, in my own. I just, but I'm not taking sides on what it means, right? So basically when you're in the first jhana, you've got, so when we look ahead next week to the Vasudhi Maga, they're very specific. Vitaka Vichara means connecting your attention and sustaining it on the object. Vasudhi Maga is clear. Pali suttas are never clear. So pick your, style, whether there's just some thinking things through or whatever, some kind of thought process happening or connecting and sustaining. Experientially, I will tell you that even with, um, uh, in the first jhana, when you come to that stillness of mind, both versions of Vitakrachar are happening. In, in later jhanas, the, the discursive drops away. But in the first jhana, it's a funny thing. It's like there's two minds. And anybody who's experienced this knows what I'm talking about. The one part of mind is unmoving. And then on top of that, there can still be some part of the mind that's kind of like, huh, what's this? Or well, that's interesting. A little bit of, so, so how can it be unmoving in another part, different parts of the brain? Too much. I don't know. It's very interesting. Uh, I don't recommend following Pali Suttas or Vasudhi Maga uh, to the person who asked that question. It's, uh, it, that's why we're trying to educate ourselves and see, and then you'll be drawn to certain teachings or teachings te or teachers or practices. What I recommend is find your way. One's not right or wrong. These systems are two different systems. You can't criticize one from, with, from outside of the system. You have to look at them from within the system. We want to honor and respect it all so that you have more choices to find your way. And it may take some experimentation. Try something, you stick with it for a while. It's like, I don't know about this. Hey, this other teacher, I like that. But you have to find your way. The Sudimag is very clear on Vitaka and Vichara. And on PT, it defines this, like different kinds of bliss. It can feel like a waterfall showering bliss and sparkly, they, I don't know how they, a list there, I forgot the details. We'll get into that next time. For here, it's kind of an open thing. So Pete, right? The main thing is the Aikagata, the steadiness of the mind. And then we look to see what else we have. All right. But let's bring in something, another piece here. 
I'm just checking the time. We're doing fine. We're going to end on time and we get into the second, third, and the fourth John and we'll move a little, a little faster. And we'll get to also talk about all the kind of cool psychic power part. That's all in there too. Being able to fly through the air and walk through walls. That stuff's in here too. I, I'm still waiting to see uh, if I can actually uh, do it, but um, uh, that stuff's in there. Look on the middle of page seven. Again, I will read it. I know you're getting a lot of my voice, I hope. It can't be helped. I'm going to read, and you can follow or just listen. The first John definition with the simile now. So first sentence is going to repeat the definition, and then there's an image that's given. Quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters and abides in the first jhana, which is characterized by rapture and pleasure, piti and sukha, born of seclusion, and accompanied by vitaka vichara, I said thought and examination. And then listen to this. He makes the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Just as a skilled bath man or a bath man's apprentice heaps bath powder in a metal, metal basin and sprinkling it gradually with water, kneads it until the moisture wets his ball of bath powder, soaks it and pervades it inside and out, yet the ball itself does not ooze. So to a bhikkhu, a monk, makes the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, so the piti and the sukha, drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body so that there is no part of the whole body, his whole body unpervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. As you're going to see, there's a lot of water imagery in the similes. Now, I love these similes. I think they're quite beautiful and they're actually quite accurate. So what is going on here? What's happening? He's making soap. So he's taking bath powder and mixing it with water. And with effort, he's working, kneading, working, doing something until it becomes this one thing. You no longer have powder or water. I mean, we're not looking under a microscope, of course, but you've got this new merged thing blended into one experiential thing called soap. This is telling us both the nature of the first jhana and the way to get in the first jhana. So whether it happens on its, so here's another important point. When you're, let's just say mindfulness of breathing again, I'm not giving that any, it's not better than any other practice, but I'll just pick that one. You're with your breath, you, you stay in with it, you're getting more and more concentrated. The jhana factors start to grow. You're getting some pleasantness, PT and sukha. You're applying and sustaining your, your attention, right? One of two things is gonna happen. Either on its own, the pleasantness is going to, when you're experiencing your breath, just whether it's a cool air at the nose or you're feeling your torso or whatever, that experience that the blissful, the PT and the sukha is going to be in your consciousness too. And it's going to start to feel like they're sort of both there in their consciousness. And it sort of feels like it's coming, this is experiential and kind of this one thing. It's sort of the breath suffused with. I call it the samadhi breath. So don't worry, don't overthink this, but they start to come together experientially. This is, this, this, this is what they're talking about. And then at some point, or you can make it happen, well, this is more of a practice issue, how you can mentally, I, I don't wanna get into it now, uh, with your mind suffuse it into the breath. On its, then either on its own, it's gonna continue and go out through the whole body and you're gonna end up with a body of light and bliss which is kind of nice when that happens. It's sort of beautiful. It's, it's healing in the body, a lot of benefits. Or you can consciously turn your attention and, and bring it into the body. That's the suffusing. And so the nature of the way it's describing, um, this is different than the Sudimaga, as it is different. Uh, the Sudimaga, you won't be able to feel your body anymore. But we'll get to that. And how it fits with this. Uh, we'll explain how do they say you can't feel your body when you're suffusing it in your body. That's next week. 
For now, in the suttas, you have this ekagata, whatever flavor you want, some kind of mental activity, uh, vitaka vichara, and you've got piti and sukha suffused through the body. So you might experience your body as sort of just having blissful feelings in it, a body of light, maybe no pain, you can just sit for long times, a uh, body of bliss, whatever it is for you. Um, that's the first jhana. If, um, if you're doing an, um, if you're doing an inclusive kind of jhana, where you haven't shut off experiences of your body and mind, coming from this deep place, you're so, like your awareness, so immersed in the body and the mind that you get all the insight part because everything's there. You don't have to go looking anymore. There is a place for going looking from an insight practice. I'm not, that's, that's got its uh, place for sure. But in this kind of state, it's just there. Everything's known. It's arising and passing away on its own. And the nature of it as this penetrative quality is, is revealed. That's where jhana, this is getting into next week on the controversy. So I'm about to say it's controversial, but jhana, samadhi, insight, mindfulness, and the heart qualities um, are synthesized and unified. That's kind of the state. Okay, maybe that's enough. So now uh, everything else is more practice. Or, so you can go back and read these and get to know them, but um, you get an idea of what people are talking about when they say John. And you can see how we don't have to have a Dharma war. It's not like somebody's right or wrong. They can all have their system and practice in that way. And we know people are getting benefit from it because they report getting benefits. All right, that's the first jhana. Now we have what's called, oh, by the way, as we talk about the first, second, and third jhana, I'm, what I'm about to say here, I'm, I'm an outlier. So some people, most teachers think they're actually dis discrete states. It's like, if you know anything, I don't know much about uh, quantum mechanics or anything, but uh, you know, the, the, the electron and the, you know, can only be in certain states orbiting around the, it's not, I can't, so they think these are discrete states, first, second, third jhana. I don't view them that way. I think it's a continuum and these are uh, markers along the way. So that's my take. All right, second jhana. Um, I'm going to page eight, second jhana, and I'm gonna read the definition. Sorry, let me just check. I don't think anybody's, um, okay. And I'm going to kind of keep moving along here at about this pace. I hope that's okay for you. It's no, you're going to have to go rest your brain. I know it's a lot of words coming at you, a lot of concepts. With the stilling of thought and examination, in other words, whatever Vitaka and Vichara were, whether it's connecting and sustaining or it's verbal, it's dropped away. It's a, it's a wordless, nonverbal state of being. With the stilling of thought and examination, you enter and abide in the second jhana, which is characterized by rapture and pleasure. The piti and sukha are still there, born of concentration, born out of the concentration of the first jhana, and accompanied by inner composure and singleness of mind without thought and, and examination. So in the second jhana, um, Vitaka Vichara has dropped away. You don't have to apply and sustain your attention because you just are in it. It's doing you. There's no, by the way, that's another, this is not in the text. I'm just, just my own take. There's no sense of doing. It's just doing you when you're in there. It's just, I mean, you still can turn your mind and apply your, it's a funny thing and, and do. They're kind of both. Anyway, that's confusing. Sorry. Um, but look at what's happening here. Oh, we talk of each other dropped away. PT and Sukha, rapture and pleasure, however you experience it, are still there. And now it's adding two more things have come in, inner composure and singleness of mind. 
Um, so it's just highlighting that the singleness of mind, that's the eka again. You could say unification. One point is, I, I think I picked up, why, I don't remember why I stuck with that singleness there. Um, I, I can't remember, but it's the same term. So it's talking about, you, it's, it's emphasizing now the importance of how this singleness has come in, the ekagata, and the inner composure. It's just highlighting. It, it's really there in the um, first jhana, but with the, uh, if you're talking to Char settling out, you're just more settled. That's the inner composure. So it's just a little bit subtler. Mainly the verbal has dropped away. Now listen to the listen to the, this. Um, um, uh, I love these similes. And then it says, um, "This is the simile." You. You attain the second jhana and then you pervade the body, this time with the rapture and pleasure born of concentration. So it's the same PT and sukha. But it's so you're pervading the body, but the image, it's just a different image. You make the, the PT and sukha drench, steep, fulfill, and pervade the body. It's repeating from the first simile, from the first jhana. So there's no part of your body unpervaded. And then it says this just as though there were a lake whose waters welled up from below. And it had no inflow, inflow from the east, west, north, or south, uh, and would not be replenished from time to time by showers of rain. Then the cool fount of water welling up in the lake, it's like coming from deep below, like an inner spring or something, would make the, that what fount of water welling up within the lake makes the cool water drench, steep, and fulfill the lake. And it goes on to say, similarly, you drench, steep, and fulfill um, fulfill the, fills the body. It's still a pervading, but you notice it's got a little bit of a more deeper settle, like the bath man. I've never made soap, but I picture someone like, like a baker or the bath man, man, they got these big muscular arms from working and making soap and they're putting effort in. Here there's a pervading, but it's coming from something very profound and deep. So it's got a more cooled out feel to the simile. simile. Uh, one question, does that mean thinking has stopped? Yes, there's no verbal going on in here, but you can still, I'll say it in words, but it's not words. Even in the deeper jhanas, you can kind of incline the mind. It's, it's not verbal, but the feeling of it's kind of like, hmm, what's that? Or check this out or incline the mind. You can still incline your mind around, but but yes, the, the, the verbal. Okay, that's the second jhana, right? Well, there's much more to say on. It's just things are settling out more. Okay. I'm not going to read all of the similes here, but um, um, let me just say a few things. In the third jhana, I'll just read the, the sentence now. You go into the third jhana. By the way, let me stop. How do you move through the jhanas? That's not really the, the focus here. Either, I just want to name it as a practice question. Either on its own, it starts, it just, you just keep practicing you're in and it just over time a short time or long time it just you just deepen and it happens or you can do something and by doing something you can consciously incline your mind towards the subtler or you can incline your mind to letting go of the coarser that's enough for now i can't get into more but there's just different approaches it's not one way to move through jhana because we're all different third jhana with the fading away of rapture pt Piti's dropped away. You abide in equanimity, mindful and clearly aware, feeling pleasure. That's the sukha still there with the body. You enter in the body and abide in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, equanimous and mindful, he abides in pleasure. So the vitaka vichara, the mental activity, is really stilled out. It's a really, it's, it, and, but you still have the sukha, it's lighter, and it even says, uh, feeling pleasure with the body. So there's still, it's a lot, it's very light when you're in here, but there's still a light sense of a pleasure in the body. And it's, it's highlighting mindfulness and clear awareness. So now you're very, very clearly aware of what's happening just by, by, by nature of the state. And then just to emphasize, emphasize it, it says the noble ones declare equanimous and mindful, you abide in pleasure. Equanimity, and that's going to come, and you'll see in the fourth, 
the 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 high the end point of the seven factors of enlightenment is equanimity. The end point of the four foundations of the mindfulness is equanimity. The end point of some other lists are at equanimity, and the end point of the jhanas is equanimity. Everything's heading to equanimity. It's the non-reactive balanced mind that actually doesn't have to be connected with any state. At some point you go past jhana and you're just going to empty it out, right? Okay. The simile you can read for yourself, but basically what it is is that um, in the first jhana, the bath man's working. In the second jhana, there's still some activity. The fount of cool water, it's, it's, it's smoother, but it is coming up. There's a movement. In the fourth, in the third jhana, you can read for yourself, uh, there's no movement. It's saying just as lotuses can, um, uh, lotuses can be born and live their whole lives, I, I guess it works this way, submerged under the water. They don't do anything, they just are submerged. Right? So there's no moving, it's just talking about how deeply immersed you are using the lotuses. Um, they're born and grow within the water and there's, from their tips to their roots. So there's no part of them that's unpervaded by that cool water. Things are smoothing out now. It's not like more is happening. It's things are dropping away. It's getting more simplified in the fourth, in the third jhana. And then finally to the fourth jhana, listen to this. It's very interesting. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, you enter and abide in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness and equanimity. That's it. You still have the ekagatas hasn't gone away. Basically, um, joy and grief is more mental. Pleasure and pain, you think of, I think it's meant to be more in the body. You're so smoothed out that you don't, when you're in the fourth jhana, there's no pain in the body. Uh, you know, you, you, the body might feel, the experience of the body, if not talking about the Sudhimaga next week, but here in the suttas, which is embodied, it's very uh, thinned out and subtle uh, connection with the body, right? Uh, but you, there's no, you're not having mental anguish or pain. Everything's because you're so mind, purity of mindfulness and equanimity. So what is characterized is just by this pure awareness and listen to the simile. You sit pervading your body with a pure, bright mind. So there's no part of your whole body unpervaded by the pure, bright mind. Just as though a man were covered from head to foot with a white cloth, so that there would be no part of his whole body not covered by the white cloth, so too a, a bhikkhu sits pervading the body with a pure, bright mind, so there's no part of your whole body unpervaded by a pure, bright mind. Well, there's the jhanas. Sutta jhanas. Does moving through the jhanas coincide with moving through the 16 steps of Anapanasati? Just depends on how you work with the Anapanasati Sutta. We talked about that earlier, so it's not, yeah, yes, oh, no, yeah. Can these three jhanas arise spontaneously when one is not actually meditating? Rarely it just spontaneously comes. Thoughts have decided there is clarity and lightness. Um, uh, um, I guess I would ask you to look, it would be, uh, I would change it to you and I would say, do the three jhanas arise spontaneously when you're not actually meditating? Does it spontaneously come? So you could, I, I don't know, you know, it's everything. People can go off in all kinds of states, so I don't really know how to answer. I don't remember that I, I can get this if you wanted and have to go back and look the term for pure bright mind. I just don't remember. Um, it's been a long time since I've done all this translation. Um, I don't, I hope I'm not missing, uh, uh, just one second, Jeff. I see your hand there. Uh, hold on a second. 
So we've got 20 minutes, and what we're going to do is, Jeff, you've got, I'm going to answer a few more of these questions, Jeff. And then, by the way, just as a teaser, we're going to look at um, three divergent paths after jhanas, which is all these psychic powers and flying through the air and all that kind of stuff. So you got to stick around for 20 more minutes to get all that. Um, when in jhana do you lose a certain level of mindfulness? No, it's actually um, mindfulness is um, the way I think about samadhi in general, jhana, but even just samadhi more broadly. You can think of some, I use two images. One is like making the mind, I used to say like a Hubble telescope, now we've got the web. It's like making your mind like the web telescope or making your mind like an electron microscope. Both images work. The mind can become very, very vast, and that level of power is amazing. And it can become very minute and detailed. And so both images work, and people will either incline their mind, choose to incline one way or the other. And that you, you should play with all those different ones and see how they serve you or not. And on its own, it can go one way or the other. How you steer it is a practice question. Um, Someone said something about their medit their body leaning and slouching. That's a practice question. I, I, I'd have to talk to you. Um, um, I, I hope I didn't miss anything on, on the on the comments. And so, um, Jeff, would you please go ahead and if you have a question or a comment, I have a question. It's a a, a bit of a fractured question. Sure. The, um, what I'm going to be taking away most helpful today is that the Gianna explorations are a deep state of letting go of the coarser from Gianna to Gianna, essentially that and everything that you've said, of course, uh, to remember and abide with. Yes. Um, the fourth Gianna, I'm curious, at what point or are we passing from awareness and sensation and uh, you know, connection with the physical body, and does it by degrees? And by the fourth jhana, it occurred to me: Are we still aware of the breath? And is the awareness that we're experiencing that's pervading the body a subtle body? Have we moved into a more profound body? Uh, I probably so. Um, you know, everything is getting very subtle at this point. Like yes. right now, you have what we call the physical body, and it's physical. If you were to go deeper and deeper down, actually just forget all this meditation, everything, just get the physicists in here, and the, we see that it's really, your body's almost all, actually really is almost all empty space anyway, and what's yes. going on in the atomic and the quantum and the quark and all that level anyway. So, yes. um, 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 I don't know subtle bodies, you know, what's really happening, but experientially, it feels like the experience in the body. So in the Vasudhi Maga, you're going to see we leave, we leave the experience of the body behind and go into pure mental. We'll talk all about that in detail next time. This time we're going through the body, but because it gets so subtle and dissolved away, you kind of end up in the same place as the Vasudhi Maga. Some people would say that's not true, but I say they kind of get to the same place anyway. So it all thins out. Is it just connecting with more the true nature of the physical body? Is it the so much? I don't know. Okay. So that's the best I know to say. Okay. I'm just only curious because one of the hindrances, the anxiety, the restlessness, and the okay. uh, confusion begins, up. Sorry. begins to set in at that point. And I genuinely become oh. frightened that I'm I'm not aware of my body. Where am I? And I sort of Right. So what I would say, and just real quick, and I'd have to yeah. talk to you. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yes. But no, but but the main thing is just real quick. Whatever's happening, even if you don't know where you are. Yes. It, sometimes people can. So then that can be scary. And then we need to either pull out and come bring it down. Right. Or we need to bring up the ability to mindfully meet with stability, whatever's happening. So That's if you know what's going on, but if you can rest in mindful awareness, that can be an ally and a support. Or you may need to kind of back out a little. So yeah, that's a practice question. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, but I hear what you, yes. It's helpful that you were, uh, what you've said has been very helpful. Okay. And I will take that with right. me. Thanks. Somebody Thank asked you. the question. Yeah. Somebody asked the question about nimitta. Nimitta uh, in the suttas, it's used. It means just a theme. 
Uh, it's never, ever, ever, this is going to be new information for some of you. Nimitta is never used in relationship to jhana or meditation. That's only a Vasudhimaka thing. Interesting. Never, ever, ever anywhere in the sutta. So we're not talking about Nimitta now. We're later when we talk about the Vasudhimaga, and then we'll come back and see how it relates to the suttas. But uh, that's the answer in Nimitta. No Nimitta here. Um, how might we get a copy of the pages that were mentioned? I, uh, sorry. How easy is it to overestimate jhana experiences? Uh, everybody's doing that all the time. <laughs> a lot of people think they're in jhana. They're not. It's okay. Really, it's fine. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's all good. And who's to, who's to judge, right? If they're getting benefit. Um, so the main thing is if we don't put a story on it and just work at what's going on here. What level of understanding do I need to help me? How do I just work experientially in the most skillful way? And we don't have to make it something. Oh, I'm in this or I'm in that. That's okay if you want to do it, but it's not necessary to make it a, th a label or whatever. Well, so what's the point of getting to jhana? Besides that, I mean, it's healing in the body. It's nourishing. It's nurturing. It, it's faith producing. Oh, does all sense contact, such as hearing, stop when in the jhana? This is controversial. Uh, can you hear in jhana or not? I don't know the answer because um, um, I've never done the experiment to be around noise. Around, I, I don't know. Uh, some teachers will say one and some will say the other. So a lot, there's lots of opinions out there. Maybe they're in different meditative states that we don't even call jhana. I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I just, sorry, I can't, can't be more. Okay, well, we're getting close to the end. So let's just add this in. The suttas give three One moment. Right, so we're going to talk about this next week. Um, some traditions talk about when to move from concentration to insight. Uh, some it's not clear. Well, this is a whole thing. It's like, are we doing, we'll talk about this next week. Are we doing concentration and insight as separate practices? Or are they kind of all together? And if you're doing them as separate practices, should you, and if so, when should you move from one to the other? Or are they actually never really separated out? We're going to do that next week to answer uh, Rayo. So if you look at the bottom of page nine and the top of page 10, the suttas give three divergent paths that you can practice after jhana. And we're coming to the end here, so I'll just say it real quickly. Um, I don't know that it's saying you should do the one or the other, or all of them, but one of them is there are four immaterial states, which are called um, uh, formless attainments. In the Vasudhi, in the Vasudhi Magha next week, you'll see they're called uh, jhan, the formless jhanas. Some people call them, like there's jhana, one, two, three, four. I think someone like Lee Brasingham calls them jhanas five, six, seven, eight. None of the texts call them, it doesn't matter, but just FYI, the suttas of the Sudhi Maga never number them as five, six, seven, eight. Maybe that's a more modern innovation. I, I don't know. It's okay. Um, but in the suttas, they're not called higher jhanas. Well, next week, the Sudhi Maga does, but they're called formless attain attainments. And the word is arupas. Rupa is form. You put an A in the beginning, it's a negation. Arupa is formless. So you can go into these form, we'll call them formless jhanas for just as a way of speaking. And I'm not going to get into it now. Um, uh, we just don't have the time. We may next week actually do it more. I'll try to. The, fit, the, the first one after the fourth jhana is called, there's boundless space. So when you're in boundless space, you're not sitting around, you can't feel your, I've heard people on retreat come back and say, oh, I was with a certain teacher. And within the first 10 days, we're all in jhana and we're all walking around in the formless attainments. That's okay, I didn't, I don't need to, great. But no, you weren't, it's formless. There's no walking around, no form. Just experience of boundless space. That could, it could be kind of blissful and light and all that. 
you're not sitting around going, wow, this is cool. Look at that. No, it's just boundless space. You won't be complaining if it happens. The next one is boundless consciousness. The next one is, um, they talk, call it like, um, like a nothingness. So that's, we're getting really subtle. I, I don't ask me questions about it. I'll talk to Alf about that. Um, and uh, the fifth one is called neither perception nor non-perception. What's that? Um, this is getting subtle. And let's just say that's what they call it. And we'll leave it alone. In my experience, here's a chat. Insight arises from concentration practice. Everybody I know who's done concentration practices sees the value of how powerfully the insight arises from being in there. But other people practice in a different way also where they aren't emphasizing the concentration. They settle a little bit and they have strong insights too. Just individual. Okay, so you can, get, you can go off in these higher immaterial or formless states and there are ways to practice it. Well, that's a practice question, not from here. Um, I can talk to you a little bit about that. I have some experience. I'm not personally that interested, but it, it can happen. It's kind of cool. Um, the second is what's called the abhinyas. I, I put it in your notes, but there's no tildes over the ends. Abhinyas. I should have put tildes in there. And there's all these, these psychic powers, uh, itties, and I forgot the whole list, but I can give them to you where you can walk through walls, have psych all these psychic powers, um, fly through the air, um, reach up and touch the sun or the moon and um, split your, have two copies of your body. So like I could be sitting here doing this and then uh, my other one could be sitting in the other room enjoying a cup of tea or something. I don't know what you do when you split your body up, but uh, these are listed in there. Um, it doesn't say why you would want to do that or what the value is. It's just listing it as something that can happen and you can aim for it. And so it's just for completeness. I said, these are some of the things that can happen. You can believe this stuff or not. It doesn't matter. I, I don't, I'm just telling you the stuff's in there so you can just be aware it's talked about. Uh, there are not many people who've reported some of these, few of these things. Um, Take it however you want. So, formless attainments, opinions, like part of the opinions are called ities, which are powers, ities or opinions. And then the third path is the develop of insight leading to Nibbana, which is the ultimate goal of the Buddhist teachings. So, the whole thing is how does jhana lead to, if you're, if you're interested in Nibbana, I don't I don't know how many of you are, or you have a different view about it. That's, that'll be a discussion for next week. Um, I won't give you my own opinion, but um, uh, and you can have your opinion. So uh, you could say liberation, enlightenment, awakening, realization, pick your turn, pick your connotation. How does, look for yourself to see how does jhana or samadhi or any practice help in where you're aiming for? That's the question for all of us. And that's, I think, a good stopping point, I hope. And we actually did it. That's what, what I was planning to do. Um, well, we got there. Well, you were all very kind. Nobody yelled at me on the chats. So I appreciate that. <laughs> By the way, someone said, if meditation were not pleasant or beneficial, no one would do it. John is equal to goodness. That's an interesting thing because the pleasure that can come, actually, this is getting more practice oriented, but has a, in the matter of the Buddhist quoted of saying, you should try to cultivate the pleasure. It has, an, it's not only part of just what happens, but has an important point to bring us in, get us closer immersed. And um, again, it has a lot of healing kind of qualities for us, just in the ordinary everyday sense too. Um, about traumas in the body can get disentangled, all kinds of benefits. Um, and we all know that, you know, when you sit to meditate, say you've never meditated before, or even people do it a long time, it gets hard if you can't concentrate and, you, and your body hurts and you, you, you just can't settle and you don't know what you're doing. It is harder to be with that. And when we start to settle a little bit, 
that samadhi is a support um, and an ally and a foundation that can really be there for us to help us in all the different ways that it works. Um, any, anything else for anyone? Right. Can you at least, I hope you can see that even if you don't remember any of these details, my hope is, is that there will be like just a sense of all of this, of how it kind of works. And then you know on your own, go back and look up details if you want. Yeah. Oh, and one last thing, someone talked about access concentration. We'll talk about that. There's no access concentration of the suttas. It's only of the Sudhimaga stage. We'll talk about that next week. So if you're practicing that system, you would use that term. I think we're done. Um, I don't have a, a bell here or anything. Um, but... Um, it's nice to hang out with you. I do, I, uh, one quick thing here. I don't know if you want to do this experiment or not, but um, um, I was just noticing that, you know, and what I'm about to say, I really mean this. It's not just, to, well, I do want to feel good, but it, I mean it. Um, when I hang around sincere Dharma practitioners, it just, I feel a lot of appreciation. I don't take that for granted. Um, and so if you find it supportive, not just being hanging out with me, but seeing all the other people and, uh, you know, perhaps the fellow who were creating a song, or really, um, if you find that uh, helpful, you can um, maybe bring some gratitude, appreciation. And if you do that, remember, you're part of creating the community for everyone else. They're all looking at your square pictures and feeling the gratitude to you. So we're all supporting each other. All right, maybe that's enough. <laughs>